Our everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. Here in Georgia, more than 10,000 people have now gotten sick. The biggest hotspot still, the metro Atlanta counties, as seen on this map, along with Doherty County in Albany in the south. Among the nearly 2,000 hospitalized, Matt Lindsay, who walked into the hospital over the weekend and today is on a ventilator fighting for his life. His battle, like so many others here in our community, we will hear from the mother of his children coming up in just a few minutes. We are also answering your money questions as more companies lay off workers and cut hours. But amid the struggle, there's some hope out there, too, with Tyler Perry surprising seniors with an incredible act of kindness. Everyone's been talking about it, and we're going to share their reactions coming up in about 20 minutes. And good evening, everyone. I'm Jeff Hollinger. We are broadcasting tonight from my house as we continue social distancing in an effort to do our part to slam this pandemic. And I'm Jennifer Bellamy in our Midtown studios. First tonight, Georgia's statewide shelter in place order has been extended now through the end of the month. Our John Shearick has more from the governor's news conference. In Governor Kemp's words, now is not the time for Georgians to get their foot off of the gas pedal. He said he believes most Georgians are complying with the shelter in place stay at home order, and he believes if they continue to do so, we'll begin to see positive results, a slowing of the virus perhaps sooner than later. So here's what he said today. He is extending the statewide shelter in place order until April 30th instead of letting it expire on April 13th. He's calling up 1,000 more National Guard members to sanitize long-term care facilities because the governor pointed out that is where seniors, the most vulnerable, have been sadly dying in groups, although the state does not have exact numbers statewide as yet. And long-term care facilities are going to have to comply with some strict orders from the governor to protect residents and staff. Facilities must adopt infectious disease transfer protocols with nearby hospitals. Visitors and non-essential personnel are strictly prohibited except in compassionate care situations. We have dramatically increased access to resources to these uh, facilities to mitigate exposure. But we have more to do to protect these Georgians. Governor Camp said he and his coronavirus task force are working round the clock to identify hospital capacity across the state, to expand hospital capacity across the state, to make sure that Georgia meets the needs of Georgians when this coronavirus pandemic is expected to peak in Georgia somewhere around April 20th. 
Well, we will continue our coverage of the coronavirus outbreak in just a moment, but we do want to make sure you are weather aware tonight. Let's get you over now to Chief Meteorologist Chris Holcomb in the Storm Tracker Center. Chris. You know, we've been talking, Jennifer, about these two rounds of storms moving through our area. One round has already moved through south and west of us. We are fine in Atlanta right now and in North Georgia, but we've been watching some of these storms that roll through areas of Thomaston, Pike, Lamar County, over toward LaGrange, also into Meriwether County. As those showers are moving down to the south and to the east and back into Alabama, you can see that severe thunderstorm watch in effect and all of those storms are moving down south and east. They're going to stay away from us, but we're not finished yet. We have additional storms that are developing. These are still going to move through tonight. This area of a thunderstorm activity is in advance of the main line, but it's causing severe storms around Huntsville in North Alabama. We'll keep an eye on that as that pushes into northwest Georgia, but that main area of severe storms is up to the north and west of us right now. This is going to be pushing into our direction and it's going to make it a, a stormy overnight period. Here's a look at those risk areas that we're talking about where you see all those tornado watches and severe thunderstorm watches to our north. That's where there is a level three risk. That's the enhanced risk and that even extends down into northwest Georgia. We have the yellow color over us, which is the slight risk or level two of five risk, meaning that overnight there's the potential for some isolated or even a few scattered stronger thunderstorms where the main threats would be damaging wind gusts the potential for hail, and even the potential for an isolated brief tornado as the system rolls through. Stay with us. We're going to walk you through the timeline during the overnight hours and let you know what happens after the system moves through. More on that in just a few minutes. All right, Chris, thank you. Remember, you can keep track of all of this weather by downloading the 11 Alive News app right now. You'll get severe weather alerts and flash flood warnings sent straight to your phone, even if you lose power. Well, as we learn more about the virus and how it's spreading, we're starting to get a closer look at who's most at risk. What's becoming clear all over the country is that communities of color are disproportionately being impacted by COVID-19. We've been asking the Georgia Department of Health to break down the COVID-19 cases by race since March 24th. A spokesperson for the department tells us that medical privacy laws prevent them from making that information public, but they were willing to give us a little bit more information showing these percentages, which highlight that blacks seem to be uh, or representing more of the cases in our state. But take a look at this graphic on your screen. In nearly two thirds of cases, the race of the person is listed as unknown. We talked to an Atlanta doctor, Patrice Harris, who is president of the American Medical Association about all of this. And for more than a week now, she's been calling on the CDC and states to release more data so we can better understand what's really happening. Pre-COVID-19, we had health inequities um, in our communities, you know, based on, uh, you know, African Americans have higher incidences of um, diabetes and hypertension, which are risk factors, right, other than, than age. We know that uh, we have different um, life expectancies based on zip codes where you live. Well, during the presidential press briefing yesterday, Dr. Anthony Fauci addressed the issue and said that we need to look closely at this information to help address the health disparities in the African-American community. Just four days ago, a DeKalb County father felt well enough to walk into the hospital on his own. But within 24 hours, his health declined dramatically. Elvin Lopez spoke to the mother of his children today. Like I wake up sometimes and I'm like, oh, God, that was a horrible nightmare. And then I realize that, no, <laughs> this is our life right now. Annalisa Silliman says she still considers her ex-husband, Matt Lindsay, to be like family. The 48-year-old is the father of her four children. When the cases of COVID-19 started to rise in Georgia, she says she mainly worried about her elderly parents. I mean, we thought maybe one of us would get sick, because, you know, but not, not, not this sick. But it was Matt who walked into Emory Hospital Saturday suffering from COVID-19 symptoms. Just a day later, she says she got a call saying he was fighting for his life and that he was the sickest patient with the virus in the hospital. He's intubated, he's on a ventilator. He's in a coma. They put him in a coma. He's, they, they've purposely paralyzed him so that he won't fight against the machine. Grieving the inability to be by his side while he's in the ICU as she also tried to comfort their children the best she can. To not be able to hold your children when their dad is suffering and maybe dying is, is a pain that is just... <sighs> Unfathomable. She says she's witnessed firsthand the virus doesn't discriminate by age. 
Yet she says she continues to see people out and about socializing and wants it to stop. It's selfish and it, people, people are not taking it seriously. While health officials have warned about the risk to seniors, they say that cases like Matt's sadly are not unusual. When you take a look at the overall Georgia cases, the majority of people who have become sick are between 18 and 59, 35 percent are over 60. And some of those younger people also are among those who have perished. One of them, 31 year old Bryce Wilson of Atlanta. His mother says he was otherwise healthy when he caught coronavirus. She says the virus put stress on his heart, causing him to suffer two heart attacks. The United States still faces challenges with testing, even as we search for COVID-19 treatments. Private labs are the ones taking care of the majority of testing in the U.S. because they have the capacity to run a lot more tests than public labs. But even at Quest Diagnostics, there's a backlog of, of, backlog rather, of about 80,000 tests, and that's one of the top two labs in the nation. Some people have had to wait a week or more before getting their results. The American Clinical Laboratory Association says private labs face shortages of test kits, specimen collection materials, and personal protective equipment. For now, private labs are focusing on getting results for high-risk cases. The American Clinical Laboratory Association is pushing now for more money from the federal government to support expanded testing efforts. Millions of Americans have filed for unemployment. Many are having trouble paying their rent. How many Americans missed a payment in April is coming up next. And each night we are bringing you updates on the coronavirus outbreak all three hours of 11 Alive News primetime on air and on our 11 Alive YouTube channel. You can subscribe and join on the conversation in the community section. There's more 11 Alive News in primetime coming up. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. There's a huge focus right now on developing vaccines and medications to save more lives. President Donald Trump continues to mention a drug that's used to treat lupus and malaria as a possible treatment. Georgia Congressman Doug Collins says he has helped secure 200,000 doses of the drug for Georgia's De uh, Department of Public Health. But our Joe Hinkey spoke with a doctor and lupus patient who are raising some concerns. A daily dose of hydroxychloroquine is how Jillian Zach Lakowski of Buford keeps lupus in check. I still get the joint swelling, the joint pain. And I have a certain type, so I've had a stroke because of it. Jillian's mom recently called a list of pharmacies, found only one with the drug still in stock, and bought a two-month supply. The concern is that it's going to start being used for COVID, and people with lupus who rely on it day to day to literally keep them alive are going to kind of get pushed mm -hmm. to the back burner. Dr. Christopher Bland with the University of Georgia's College of Pharmacy says hydroxychloroquine began as a malaria treatment and became a well-known lupus and arthritis treatment. 
it's been used uh, very effectively, has a lot of great data for patients within those disease states. Now, President Donald Trump is touting the pill as a possible COVID-19 treatment. Could be a game changer. NBC News reports the FDA fast-tracked the pill for clinical trials. And this week, Congressman Doug Collins tweeted, proud to have worked with Amnil Pharmaceuticals to help secure 200,000 doses of hydroxychloroquine for the Georgia Department of Public Health. Collins' office tells 11 Alive those doses are in addition to Amnil's usual production. Bland says it's too early to tell if the drug could cure COVID-19. Most of the data we have specific to COVID-19 has been very limited. And a lot of the doses that are being evaluated for COVID-19, some of these are higher than what we use for traditional like rheumatoid arthritis. Increasing possible side effects and the need, Bland says, for the pill to only be used right now with COVID-19 patients being monitored at a hospital. There have been some patients that have had some of those cardiac arrhythmia type side effects and they've had to stop the drug. Mm -hmm. Here are three stories you may have missed today. First, Twitter and Square co-founder Jack Dorsey has pledged a billion dollars to fight against COVID-19. Dorsey announced he would devote the money to help fund relief efforts. He says that amount is about 28% of his net worth. It's the biggest donation contribution made by a private donor to date. The virus continues to impact airports all over the country. According to the TSA, fewer than 100,000 people were screened yesterday. The agency says that's a record low. So to put that in perspective, on the same date last year, that number was a little more than 2 million. And the number of apartment renters who could make rent in April fell by 12%. According to the National Multifamily Housing Council, 69% of apartment households paid rent through April 5th. That's a 12% drop from the 81% who paid by March 5th and a 13% de decrease from the 82% that paid this time last year. The council's tracker includes data from more than 13 million units across the country. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. We're kind of in between two systems right now. Round one of showers and storms already came through earlier. It didn't really impact us here in North Georgia or Metro Atlanta. That was mainly on the south side where you can see some of these showers that rolled through. They're now pretty much Macon and southward down toward Warner Robins. But a little earlier, uh, folks from LaGrange over into Meriwether County, Pike, Lamar County and Upson County, you had to deal with some strong storms and we had some winds in some of those that were 40 miles an hour or greater. And you can see back in Alabama, that they have canceled that uh, uh, severe thunderstorm watch that I was telling you about earlier as these storms are weakening as they continue to move to the south and east. So this round one is pushing away. We don't have to worry about these particular showers anymore. The next round is up to our north and we do have some stronger storms in North Alabama in advance of the main line that's still well out to the west. We did have a severe thunderstorm warning with these near Huntsville. They're weakening. They're moving down toward the south and to the east and we're going to be watching these as they move into Northwest Georgia. I do think that they will weaken by the time they get in there. But as I mentioned, this is in advance of the main system. Look at this. These tor tornado watches in effect numerous severe thunderstorm warnings. We have had tornado warnings within this as well. This is the system that's going to move quickly down toward the south and east and even some showers and storms up ahead of that. That's what's going to be moving through during the overnight hours, really more toward tomorrow morning when we see our highest risks for some stronger storms. Take a look at those risk areas. We showed you this earlier, but again, this is mainly in those spots uh, north and west of us through Tennessee, Kentucky, southern Indiana, Illinois, through parts of uh, Missouri and northwest Arkansas. That's the level three out of five risk. That's the enhanced risk, and that extends down into northwest Georgia. We have the yellow color, which is the slight risk or the level two out of five, meaning as these storms roll in, there is the potential that some of those could turn severe with damaging wind gusts, possible hail and even the potential for a brief tornado, but that tornado risk is on the low end. So here's the timeline this evening. We're looking fine. You can see those showers that were coming in from Alabama. They'll weaken. They won't be as strong as they roll in here by two in the morning. We're still going to be OK here, but that's when we start watching that line of storms that is going to start moving into northwest Georgia. We'll stop this at four in the morning, still not arriving in Atlanta yet, but it'll be stretching from Rome, parts of Polk County through Cherokee County, nearing areas of uh, Hall County, Dawson County over toward the Clayton area and Rabin County. And that line continues to move our way. This is at five in the morning with showers and thunderstorms possible here and still within this line. 
that's where we have the potential for some of those stronger storms with the damaging winds. But notice how this is moving pretty quickly by seven o'clock. It's already well down to the south, so it is a fast moving system, but as those storms roll through, they are still going to be pretty strong. And then back behind this system, even though the storms are going to move out, it's going to turn windy back behind this frontal boundary that pushes our way. We're going to see winds coming out of the northwest at about 20 miles an hour sustained and even some gusts around 35 miles an hour. That'll be enough to bring down some trees, maybe some tree limbs coming down. And if those hit any power lines, we could see some power outages. Now again, it's not thunderstorm winds tomorrow we're dealing with. It's the with the general winds coming in behind that front. So during the day tomorrow, just that chance for some storms really early in the morning, and then it clears out highs near 77 degrees with the windy conditions. Here's another look. This is the RPM model showing a pretty similar timeline. Quiet conditions here tonight. Then we're watching that line of storms that'll be coming in throughout the early morning hours and then pushing down to the south. This model is a little bit slower than the one I showed you earlier, but the whole point is it's happening overnight and early in the morning, and then we clear out during the day tomorrow and it'll turn breezy and then it gets colder by Friday. We're going to see a high of only 64 degrees Saturday morning. We start off at 41, even some 30s in the outlying areas Saturday, then rebounding back up to 70 Sunday for Easter. Not only showers, but we have another risk for strong storms coming in on Sunday that ends on Monday and then we're dry again Tuesday and Wednesday with temperatures trending back down into the upper 60s. There are now three coronavirus bills that have been signed into law, and now Congress is trying to figure out their next legislative steps, which will include an interim bill and a second CARES Act. We will see when that transpires. But in the interim, the bill would address the new Paycheck Protection Program, which supplies small businesses with a forgivable loan. The first CARES Act provided the program with $350 billion, but now lawmakers are concerned the money will quickly run out due to overwhelming demand. Yesterday, the White House requested an additional $250 billion for the loan program. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says he hopes it can be approved during the next scheduled Senate session. That is on Thursday. Now, with the stimulus checks falling into the hands of some Americans soon, there are questions about how much money you could be getting from the government. 11 Alive's Chenu Hur took some of your questions to financial expert Anthony, uh, excuse me, Andrew Polis. All right, Andrew, thank you so much for uh, joining me tonight to talk through some of these questions that I'm sure lots of people are having right now. And we'll just get right into it uh, with the first question here. And that is, when will Americans start receiving stimulus checks and who will get them? Thanks for having me on. Uh, we expect that to see Americans start getting stimulus checks hopefully in the next uh, two weeks, maybe short, a quicker time frame than that, but uh, to, uh, to not... Uh, have any false expectations, I would say at the moment, about two weeks. Uh, the the Treasury has got to communicate with the IRS, uh, go through the database to figure out who's going to qualify for these stimulus checks. The qualifying factors uh, are going to be based on either your 2018 or your 2019 tax return if you've already filed the 19 return. And, and Andrew, this next question, very important for people who will be receiving these checks. How can people update mailing and direct deposit information? Yeah, great question. The IRS has, uh, has come out and said that they're working on a portal system on their website to be able to facilitate and set up infrastructure for uh, people to be able to go on to the IRS website, create a secure account, update bank account information. We have put together a guide to companies that are hiring as a resource for the many people who have lost their jobs because of the crisis. You can find that in the As Seen on TV section of the 11 Alive app. Ahead in prime time, an act of kindness from media mogul Tyler Perry to some people who really needed a break during this pandemic. We're going to show you all of the reactions next. Truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only.
We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. An incredible act of generosity this morning, lighting up social media after Tyler Perry bought the groceries for all of the seniors and high risk shoppers at 73 grocery stores. It's happened at 44 Kroger stores here in Georgia and 29 Win Dixie locations in Louisiana. Our Caitlin Ross reports shoppers were so shocked to find out that their entire bill was covered. A mask cannot hide this joy, a virus cannot defeat this hope. The tears of joy in the eyes of shoppers this morning shine through the fear of our most vulnerable citizens. In these very uh, troubling, difficult, and sometimes even dark times, um, I think of the Atlanta Angel as a, a bright light who shines. Aaron Swenson's bill was paid at the Togo Hills Kroger this morning. At 7 a.m., no one knew who donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to pay for seniors' groceries, and the store manager wouldn't say a word. And she said, so your groceries are free. <laughs> I still really wouldn't believe her. <laughs> and, and I, you know, I kind of was dumbfounded. And she said, uh, an Atlanta angel uh, is giving you your groceries. Aaron said the expressions of the other shoppers who realized they wouldn't have to worry about how to put food on the table this week were incredible. I looked at all the people in the store who, who were shopping and thought, wow, I, I just wanted to hang around and watch. <laughs> As news spread online of the good deed, thousands of people speculated it had to be Atlanta media mogul Tyler Perry. Just Monday, he left a $21,000 tip for servers at a local restaurant. The grocery store is later confirming it was him. It's big gestures like that, or even small gestures like smiling at each other, that Aaron says will get us through this. We're not distant from each other. In our daily lives, we are deeply connected. We breathe the same air. And, you know, that's one of the things that it's teaching us. And you know, I, I hope that we have an opportunity to come out of this uh, better than we were before. Amazing story. Thank you to Mr. Perry. Well, check out this amazing light show. It signals the end of the coronavirus lockdown in Wuhan, China. But ahead for you tonight, why health officials are telling people they need to be careful as they move forward. Be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. This video is an incredible sign of hope as medical staff cheer for Samantha Cook, who was just able to leave the ICU. After showing symptoms of COVID-19, she had to be put on a ventilator and nearly died. Pastor Jeremiah Chapman says people held prayer services for her in the hospital parking lot. And after 11 days of being on that ventilator, she began to show signs of improvement. We certainly hope that she continues in her recovery. Right now, the United States is on an uphill slope of new cases, but after 11 weeks on lockdown, the place where this all began, Wuhan, China, well, they are starting to lift social distancing restrictions and starting to get back to normal. Despite these signs of hope, Chinese health officials say there's still room for caution as they move forward. On the move again, buses and trains ready to roll and people optimistic in Wuhan, China. Tuesday, the country reported no new deaths from COVID-19 in the last 24 hours. And before that, daily deaths had remained in the single digits for weeks. It's welcome news for the people of China that recovery as a nation is possible, but can also signal hope for those watching as our own countries, including the United States, wrestle with the new coronavirus. The World Health Organization says the outbreak began in Wuhan in December of 2019, and now months later, signs of promise as barriers come down and people look towards a return to normal life. China over the weekend even shipping 82 tons of medical supplies to Spain, a country beginning to see its own drops in infections and deaths. Still, China's National Health Commission is cautioning against getting too far ahead of the process, warning the country still faces a risk of new outbreaks that could come from imported cases. More than 81,000 cases have been confirmed in China, and while Tuesday brought just 32 new ones, they all came from people who had returned to the country from overseas. The number of people dying from coronavirus in the United States continues to rise. Numbers from Johns Hopkins University showing more than 13,000 people have died, but there are some encouraging signs in the United States that maybe we are indeed flattening the curve of the pandemic. And according to Dr. Deborah Burks, she warns that this does not mean we are in the clear, but it does show that staying at home and following social distancing is having a positive impact, but still there's great work to be done. What's really important is that people don't turn these early signs of hope into releasing from the 30 days to stop the spread. It's really critical and you can see the delay. So if people start 
going out again and socially interacting, we could see a very acute second wave very early. So we are really encouraging every American to continue to follow the guidelines for these 30 days. In Georgia, we are still about two weeks away from the estimated peak day for deaths from COVID-19. Our curve is not flat. Cases continue to go up with 1,000 reported over the past 24 hours. We have more on how social distancing can help reduce cases of coronavirus and flatten the curve. The phrase that you know so well. Two months ago, you wouldn't have known what that meant. Oh, we know what it means now. You can find out more information in the article on 11alive.com. Chris. Keeping an eye on the next wave of storms that'll be moving our way, you can see some of those that are in North Alabama right now. That's still well in advance of the main line that's still out in the Midwest. The first line that came through really just impacted areas on the south side. We had some strong storms that rolled through parts of Pike, Lamar County, Upson County. That's all now moving just to the south of Macon. But here comes that next round. You can see it right up here in Huntsville. Again, ahead of that main line where we have some isolated, stronger storms. A lot of lightning with this, some strong winds. We did have a severe thunderstorm warning in effect with this over near Huntsville earlier that is now uh, expired, but that's going to be moving down toward the south and the east. We'll be watching some of these counties here in northwest Georgia. We expect those to weaken a little bit as they keep moving our way, but here's the main system and, and just look at the tornado watches in effect, severe thunderstorm watches, numerous severe thunderstorm warnings, even a tornado warning there in the northern parts of Arkansas. All of this and a lot of the moisture ahead of that is moving our way and we're going to see this rolling through our area during the overnight hours. Here's another look at those risk areas. I'm showing you in this over and over again because I just want you to see it's not very often that we see this enhanced risk or level three of five risk and we have that covering many states there to the north and west and it even extends down into northwest Georgia. We're in the level two of five risk. This counties that you see here in yellow, which is really the rest of north Georgia, metro Atlanta and areas down to the south. That's where we have the potential still for some damaging wind gusts, the potential for hail, and even the chance for an isolated brief tornado. That tornado risk, though, is on the low end. Stay with us. This is going to be one of those overnight type systems and really more toward early tomorrow morning when we see this move through. We're going to take a look at our latest computer model data with that timeline in just a few minutes. Chris, thank you. Make sure you keep track of this weather by downloading the 11 Alive News app. You'll get severe weather alerts and any flash flood warnings sent straight to your phone, even if you happen to lose power. A tiger at the Bronx Zoo has tested positive for COVID-19. It is a story getting a lot of attention worldwide because according to the Wildlife Conservation Society, the tiger was infected by an asymptomatic zoo worker. Now, this case is prompting a lot of pet owners of cats, of dogs all around the country, all around the world for that matter, wondering if their pet might be vulnerable to COVID-19. Here's NBC. The Bronx Zoo has been closed since mid-March, but coronavirus still crept in, infecting a four-year-old Malayan tiger. She was um, test positive, and it surprised everyone because that hadn't been documented before. Zoo officials believe the tiger was exposed by an asymptomatic zoo worker. Six other large cats have similar mild symptoms, including a dry cough. All are expected to recover, but zoos are stepping up safety measures. Workers at the Oakland Zoo now wearing personal protective equipment when within six feet of several animals, including big cats. But right now, experts don't believe your cat or dog is at risk. There's no evidence that uh, people can pass it on to their pets. Uh, there's been several studies and things shown that, and there's not been a single case in the United States, and with all the po thousands of positives, not a single case where a pet has gotten sick yet from a positive person. But the American Veterinary Medical Association says take precautions if you test positive and ask someone else to care for your pet. There's no sense introducing something to them that they may have to deal with, even though they'll probably just form immunity to it uh, and they won't shed it to anybody else. And if you're healthy, keep washing your hands before and after playing with your pet or going for a walk to do all you can to care for your four-legged family members. Both the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the American Veterinary Medical Association says there is no evidence, none whatsoever, that an animal can pass the virus to a human.
Calling it a difficult decision, a painful decision, Democratic presidential hopeful Bernie Sanders has officially dropped out of the race for the White House. But in a videotaped message for his supporters, Sanders promised their movement and their message will continue to be a part of the campaign. NBC's Jay Gray has the latest for us tonight. I have concluded that this battle for the Democratic nomination will not be successful. Bernie Sanders out of the presidential race, but not leaving the process. While this campaign is coming to an end, our movement is not. He says that he'll stay on the ballot in upcoming primaries with the hopes of influencing the party platform and key issues at the now postponed Democratic convention. Then together, standing united, we will go forward to defeat Donald Trump, the most dangerous president in modern American history. President Trump reacting in a series of posts online, taking swipes at Joe Biden, who he calls Sleepy Joe, the Democratic Party, and urging Sanders supporters to come to the Republican Party. In a written statement, Biden thanks Sanders, calling him a powerful voice for a fairer and more just America, reaching out to his supporters and promising the independent will be a part of the path forward, echoing something he said a day earlier on the Today Show. Yeah, I can tell you one thing, I would very much want Bernie to be part of the journey. A journey to the White House that is now a two-man race. doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this? Our Verify team is working nonstop to answer the questions you have about coronavirus, like this viewer question 
about the stimulus checks that we're some of us are about to receive and whether they're coming out of your taxes next year. Our Jason Puckett has the answer for you. Viewer Lindy Horowitz sent us this question. Quote, is the stimulus check in advance for taxes 2020? We've also received a number of emails wondering if you have to pay taxes on the stimulus checks. So that's what we're verifying. Are the stimulus checks in advance of credit for 2020 taxes? And do you have to pay taxes on them? Our sources are the CARES Act itself and the IRS and U.S. Department of Treasury, along with documentation from Senator Dianne Feinstein. So quick recap, the CARES Act, which passed in late March, includes stimulus money for multiple businesses and a large chunk to help American taxpayers. The bill uses your 2018 or 2019 tax returns to determine if you qualify for a payment based on your income. It basically boils down to this. Adults who filed taxes get $1,200 each and their qualifying children get $500. If your adjusted gross income is over $75,000 individually, or 150,000 for joint filings, the amount of that credit decreases up until 99,000 for an individual and 198,000 for a joint filing. Past that, no checks. Okay, so those are the numbers. The big question though, are we gonna have to pay that back? No, the act itself calls these a quote, advance refund. That's a tax credit they're paying you now. Basically, the credit lowers the amount of taxes you pay in 2020, and that difference is being sent to you now as a refund. So we can verify you don't have to pay it back. Senator Feinstein's office also confirmed that since it's a tax credit, we don't pay additional taxes on the money. If you've got more questions like this, send us an email. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. Not a bad evening out there right now. We have comfortable temperatures, dry weather here in the Atlanta area, but we're watching some rain that's beginning to move into northwest Georgia and even a few thunderstorms back in parts of northern Alabama. We showed you these a little bit earlier. These, when they were around Huntsville, prompted a severe thunderstorm warning. But as these are moving down toward the south and east, we're noticing signs that they're weakening a little bit, not quite as strong as they were just a little while ago when it was near Huntsville. We still have some lightning with us around Scottsboro, Alabama. We're keeping an eye on these as they move down toward the south and east. Uh, Dade, Walker County, mainly down into parts of Tatuga County, possibly into Floyd County. We may see some of those hold together as they move in. We do have some light showers, though, in far northwest Georgia. This is in advance of the main area of rain and big time storms that are still out to the west. We have numerous uh, tornado watches in effect, severe thunderstorm watches, and then a lot of severe thunderstorms storm warnings, even a tornado warning just over the line from western Tennessee, really uh, north and west of the Memphis area where there's a tornado warning going on right now. This area of rain and storms will continue to move our way, and this is what's going to move into our area during the overnight hours. We don't think it's going to be as strong over Georgia as it is out to the west, but still the potential for some severe weather. Here is another look at that risk area where there is that level three. Actually, this is a live look uh, in Rome right now where we are looking out toward the west. We're not seeing any lightning in the distant sky right now as we're looking toward the west where those storms are actually coming from. Here's that enhanced risk. That's a level three out of five risk for much of Tennessee, Kentucky, southern Indiana, Illinois, also into Missouri and Arkansas. And part of that enhanced risk or level three risk extends into northwest Georgia. We are in the level two risk, the, which you see here in yellow, where we have the potential for some stronger storms to develop during the overnight hours. The main threats will be damaging wind gust, hail, and there's even the potential for a brief tornado. Now, again, we think this is going to be weakening a little bit as it moves our way, but still that potential for some strong storms. Take a look at the pollen count for today. 3102 from Mulberry, Oak, Pine, Willow and Sycamore. And as you can see, the numbers have kind of been up and down this week. At least it's down from our, our reading from yesterday that was above 4000. And uh, we'll see what this does for tomorrow. The wind is going to kick up tomorrow behind some of this rain, and that might actually stir up some pollen that is already out there. We had a high today of 81, 10 degrees above the average. Uh, we should be around 71 this time of year. We picked up one one hundredth of an inch of rain. That rainfall surplus about just a little bit under 11 and a half inches above where we should be in rainfall. So here you see the evening hours will be dry, but then once we get into the overnight, that's when we see some of those showers and storms. Temperatures will be holding in the 60s by tomorrow morning, 7, 8 o'clock here in Atlanta. The rain's already going to be out of here, so we're going to see some improving weather. So we're just tracking those storms out there overnight. Then it's going to be windy and cooler behind that front, and we have a wind advisory in effect for tomorrow. And then as we're drying off and cooling off for Friday and Saturday morning, 
It's going to be dry on Saturday, but then on Sunday another round of rain moves in and there's even the chance for some storms with that. So here's a look at the wasometer. We're going to go with the seven. This is our scale from one to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day. Highs near 77. The showers really early tomorrow. Then we clear out and it turns windy. Here's a look at those storms for tonight. You can see those showers developing during the overnight hours sweeping through. Once we get through the early morning hours, those move out quickly. There's that northwest flow, rather breezy conditions here. And on Friday, another nice day with partly cloudy skies. It's going to stay dry here on Friday, but it's going to be cooler with highs only in the 60s. And then as we move into the weekend, Saturday looks dry. A few clouds around here Sunday showers and yes, the potential for some storms for Easter. Check it out. 77 for a high Thursday with those showers ending early. Then it turns windy, chilly. Well, cool on Friday with the high of 64 chilly Saturday morning though down to 41. That means 30s in the outlying areas with the high of 70 Sunday. There's the rain again storms ending early Monday as we clear out again, cooling back off Tuesday and Wednesday with that dry weather in place with highs in the upper 60s. Here's the story of sports and economics. Most universities depend on their their football programs to bring in the revenue that helps buoy all of the other sports. At smaller football programs, not smaller universities like Georgia State and Kennesaw State, which are huge universities, but they have smaller football programs. So how will that impact them if there is significantly less money coming in during the fall? Here's Alex Glaze to explain. One of the ways mid-major schools make money is by playing money games. Those are games where small schools play for guaranteed money to participate in games against bigger schools. Last year, Tennessee paid Georgia State $900,000 to play a football game. This year, Georgia State is scheduled to play Alabama for $1.3 million. So what happens if that game's unable to be played? If the game's not played, it's played in September. We've got a full you know, year from a business standpoint to, to reallocate resources or to try to replicate that revenue. The solution isn't so simple for other schools. Morehouse is projecting to make close to $300,000 this year by playing in three classics. In the HBCU world, those are things that are kind of the, the revenue generators for us. We don't get the TV deals like the SEC network, ACC network. We don't, we don't have those type of partnerships. If those games can't happen, they won't be paid. Well, it's not the loss of that revenue would, would take away a lot of opportunities that we are planning. When it comes to television deals and mid-major schools, the revenue is by and large minimal. At Kennesaw State, they receive around $50,000 from a deal that the Big South and ASUN Conference have with ESPN. We're more uh, heavily relied on the university and student fees. Small schools also rely a lot on philanthropy. And as Americans continue to lose their jobs during this global pandemic, the facts are some simply can't afford to donate right now. Right now, it, you know, rightfully so, all families should be focused on uh, making sure that their families are good. Well, neighbors walking down one busy street in Buckhead are stopping every day for a much needed laugh and some much needed uh, uh, joy in their lives nowadays. This has been going on for three weeks and these sisters here on your screen have posted a joke of the day on their mailbox on Peachtree Battle Avenue. Now they have received notes in return asking them to please keep it up. And one neighbor even wrote that they have changed their walking route so they don't miss a day. Other neighbors take pictures of the jokes to pass on the laughter. Someone might not be like the happiest right now because school's canceled and everything. So it's good for so it, it's it might make them feel good to at least to like see something fun and smile. Well, they say they will continue to post their daily jokes until these times are past. Passover began this evening, but the Jewish holiday will look a lot different this year. Up next, how one local rabbi is encouraging his community to embrace the change. Of broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, 
live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. We want to wish all of our friends who are celebrating Passover tonight, uh, the happiest of Passover. The Jewish holiday began at sundown, followed by a traditional dinner known as the Seder. But due to social distancing, this year's celebration will be a lot different from others. Here's Rabbi New to explain. One of the things that I've noticed during social distancing is that people are being pretty social with their even extended family. So I assume that a lot of families are going to uh, be using uh, med uh, mediums like Zoom to help them connect with each other. Do the best that you can. Take the take the Passover rituals. Make the best effort that you can, and uh, have a intimate one-on-one -on -one connection with God. If you're on your own, call your siblings, call your friends beforehand, and connect with them. And then have a one-on-one -on -one experience with God. I think for this year, for whatever reason, that seems to be the way God wants it. The impact of social distancing, it was felt at the dinner table tonight. Survey USA polled 1,000 people nationwide. 15% say they celebrate Passover. On average, they expect only three people to be there in person for their Seder. That's down from about four and a half in a typical year, but this is anything but a typical year. 36% expect to have family and friends join the celebration virtually by Zoom, FaceTime, or another type of video chat. We will take a break. We're back with more 11 Alive News Prime Time right after this. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Prime Time, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. 
We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Plasma from people who have recovered from COVID-19 is a valuable resource. Antibodies in their blood could be used to develop vaccines, testing and treatment. So the Red Cross and Emory University are developing plasma donation programs. Our 11 Alive investigator Andy Parati recently recovered from the virus and just donated plasma. It was really important for me to do this, and it started after I stopped exhibiting symptoms for seven days. And my doctor called me and he asked, would I be willing to donate my plasma for research? And I said yes. The process was really simple and took less than 30 minutes. It started with the test to make sure I didn't have the virus. The results came back negative this past Monday, and then my physician, Dr. Nicholas Boyu, took a very small sample of my blood to give to a private lab for research. Doctors say recovered patients are a valuable commodity right now because the antibodies in their blood could hold the key to help combat this virus. So if the virus looks like this, your body is gonna build an antibody against it. If it looks like that, like a lock and key. Mm -hmm. Now it's identified this as a foreign particle. Other elements of the immune system will come in to destroy the virus. What a gift to give if someone's battled through this virus and recovered, but the state doesn't track people who have recovered. A lot of people who were sick couldn't get tested. So Andy, I'm curious, what is the process going to be like to gather as much of this valuable plasma as possible? Sure, according to the experts that I spoke with, it's gonna come down to developing a test to identify those who have recovered from the virus to see if they have the antibodies to help treat others. Thanks a lot, Andy. I know you're going to have more on your process, donating your plasma and how this all works coming up tonight, up late at 11. Well, we are hearing from people just like Andy who want to donate plasma. If that's you or someone you know and you'd like to sign up, we have a link in the story right now on 11alive.com and in the 11 Alive app. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. Here in Georgia, more than 10,000 people have gotten sick. The biggest hot spot still in the metro Atlanta counties as seen here on this map, along with Dougherty County, just to the south. Among the nearly 2,000 hospitalized, Matt Lindsay, who walked into the hospital over the weekend and today is on a ventilator fighting for his life. His battle, like so many others here in our community, we're going to hear from the mother of his children coming up in just a few minutes. We're also answering your money questions as more companies lay off workers and cut hours. But amid the struggle, hope too, with Tyler Perry surprising dozens of seniors with an incredible act of kindness. They're sharing their reaction coming up in about 20 minutes. Good evening, I'm Aisha Howard. First tonight, Georgia's statewide shelter in place order has been extended through the end of the month. John Sherrick has more from the governor's press conference. In Governor Kemp's words, now is not the time for Georgians to get their foot off of the gas pedal. He said he believes most Georgians are complying with the shelter in place stay at home order and he believes if they continue to do so, we'll begin to see positive results, a slowing of the virus perhaps sooner than later. So here's what he said today. He is extending the statewide shelter in place order until April 30th instead of letting it expire on April 13th. He's calling up 1,000 more National Guard members to sanitize long-term care facilities because the governor pointed out that is where seniors, the most vulnerable, have been sadly dying in groups, although the state does not have exact numbers statewide as yet. And long-term care facilities are going to have to comply with some strict orders from the governor to protect residents and staff. 
facilities must adopt infectious disease transfer protocols with nearby hospitals. Visitors and non-essential personnel are strictly prohibited except in compassionate care situations. We have dramatically increased access to resources to these uh, facilities to mitigate exposure, but we have more to do to protect these Georgians. Governor Camp said he and his coronavirus task force are working round the clock to identify hospital capacity across the state, to expand hospital capacity across the state, to make sure that Georgia meets the needs of Georgians when this coronavirus pandemic is expected to peak in Georgia somewhere around April 20th. We will continue our coverage of the coronavirus outbreak coming up in just a bit, but we are also weather aware tonight. Let's get you over to Chief Meteorologist Chris Holcomb back in the Storm Tracker Center, keeping a close eye on the system for us, Chris. Yeah, we have some storms that are going to be moving our way tonight. That's why I'm back in the studio, and even though I am here in the studio, we are still practicing social distancing. I'm far away from everybody else in the newsroom. I'm the only person back here in the Storm Tracker Center. You see my phone over right here, though. I feel like I'm with 480 people right now. That's how many folks are on Facebook Live. If you have any questions about this weather or want to talk about the weather, join me on Facebook Live. It's at Chris Holcomb 11 Alive page and join us there. We're talking a lot of people asking about these storms. So let me show you what we're watching. Nothing going on here in Atlanta right now. We had some showers and storms with the first round. Th those were on the south side earlier. Now we're waiting for this next round to come in and this is just well ahead of that. That actually prompted a severe thunderstorm warning in the Huntsville area a little bit earlier. That's weakening as it gets closer to northwest Georgia, but I want you folks in uh, Chattooga County, Floyd County, keep an eye on this. I just had one, so somebody on Facebook Live said they were hearing the thunder uh, in the Tryon area in Northwest Georgia, but that's well ahead of this. This is the main system that comes in overnight. It has prompted numerous tornado watches, severe thunderstorm watches, severe thunderstorm warnings. We've got a tornado warning in uh, Northeast Arkansas, uh, others right here in uh, parts of Indy of uh, Illinois. This is the system moving toward us. We do think it's going to be a little bit weaker by the time it gets here, but we will have a severe weather risk. Let's take a look at those uh, risk areas right now. The tan color that you see up where we have all of those tornado watches, that is the level three of five risk. That's the enhanced risk, and that extends down into northwest Georgia. We're in the yellow color here, which is the slight risk or level two of five risk. We have the potential for some isolated, stronger storms developing overnight. The main threats would be damaging wind gusts, hail, maybe even a brief tornado possible with this as it rolls through, but the tornado risk is going to be on the low end. Stay with us. We we have more on the timing of this. We'll show you an updated forecast track as this moves through overnight. More on that coming up. All right, thanks, Chris. You can keep track of this weather by downloading the 11 Alive News app. That's where you're going to get severe weather alerts and flash flood warnings sent right to your phone, even if your power goes out. Just four days ago, a DeKalb County father who had gotten sick felt OK enough to walk into a hospital on his own. Within 24 hours, his condition changed drastically. Elwin Lopez spoke to the mother of his children today. I wake up sometimes and I'm like, oh God, that was a horrible nightmare. And then I realize that no, <laughs> this is our life right now. Annalisa Silliman says she still considers her ex-husband, Matt Lindsay, to be like family. The 48-year-old is the father of her four children. When the cases of COVID-19 started to rise in Georgia, she says she mainly worried about her elderly parents. I mean, we thought maybe one of us would get sick, because, you know, but not, not, not this sick. But it was Matt who walked into Emory Hospital Saturday suffering from COVID-19 symptoms. Just a day later, she says she got a call saying he was fighting for his life and that he was the sickest patient with the virus in the hospital. He's intubated, he's on a ventilator. He's in a coma. They put him in a coma. He's, they, they've purposely paralyzed him so that he won't fight against the machines. Grieving the inability to be by his side while he's in the ICU, as she also try to comfort their children the best she can. To not be able to hold your children when their dad is suffering and maybe dying is, is a pain that is just... <sighs> Unfathomable. She says she's witnessed firsthand the virus doesn't discriminate by age. Yet she says she continues to see people out and about socializing and wants it to stop. It's selfish and it's people people are not taking it seriously. 
While health officials have repeatedly warned about the risk to seniors, cases like Matt sadly are not unusual. When you take a look at overall Georgia cases, the majority of people who've gotten sick are between 18 and 59 years old. 35% are over 60. Some of those younger people are also among those who died. One of them, 31 year old Bryce Wilson of Atlanta. His mom says he was otherwise healthy when he caught coronavirus. He says she says the virus put stress on his heart, causing him to suffer two heart attacks. As we learn more about how the virus is spreading, we're starting to get a closer look at who's most at risk. What's becoming clear across the country is that communities of color are disproportionately being affected by COVID-19. We've been asking the Georgia Department of Health to break down the COVID-19 cases by race since March 24th. A spokesperson for the department tells us that medical privacy laws prevent them from making that information public, but they were willing to give us a little bit more information showing percentages with that that do highlight that black seem to represent more of the cases in Georgia. But look at this graphic in nearly two thirds of cases. The race of the person is listed as unknown. So why is the coronavirus taking a greater toll on African Americans? Here's Tracy Potts with some answers. New from the CDC today, African Americans make up a third of people hospitalized with the coronavirus, but only 12% of the U.S. population. There are a lot of myths around there that uh, um, African Americans are immune from the disease. That is not true. In fact, experts think African Americans may face more severe cases due to higher rates of diabetes, obesity, asthma, and heart disease. We don't think African Americans are more susceptible to getting infected, but we do think with those number of pre existing conditions. With those conditions, recovery gets more complicated. Today, New York City's mayor broke down disparities in his city. The black community, 28% of the deaths compared to about 22% of the overall population. It made me angry to see that the, the disparities that have plagued this city, this nation, that are all about fundamental inequality. In the Midwest, it's worse. African Americans make up 30% of Chicago's population, but nearly 70% of the city's deaths. Those numbers take your breath away. African American coronavirus deaths more than double the population in Louisiana and greater Milwaukee, nearly triple in Michigan. COVID-19 is the um, perfect storm for our black and brown communities, which are mostly low, are low income. You know, they're going to be the most affected due to lack of access to testing. Many of them still working on the front lines as essential workers or service workers. Millions of Americans have filed for unemployment. Many are having trouble paying rent. How many Americans missed the payment in April next? We are bringing you updates on the coronavirus outbreak. All three hours of prime time on air and on the 11 Alive YouTube channel. Subscribe and join the conversation in the community section. We've got more 11 Alive news in prime time after the break. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily.
There's a huge focus right now on developing vaccines and medicines to save more lives. President Trump continues to mention a drug used to treat lupus and malaria as a possible treatment. Georgia Congressman Doug Collins says he helped secure 200,000 doses of the drug for Georgia's Department of Public Health. But Joe Henke talked with a doctor and lupus patient who are raising concerns. A daily dose of hydroxychloroquine is how Jillian Zach Lakowski of Buford keeps lupus in check. I still get the joint swelling, the joint pain, and I have a certain type, so I've had a stroke because of it. Jillian's mom recently called a list of pharmacies, found only one with the drug still in stock, and bought a two-month supply. The concern is that it's going to start being used for COVID, and people with lupus who rely on it, day to day to literally keep them alive are going to kind of get pushed to the back burner. Dr. Christopher Bland with the University of Georgia's College of Pharmacy says hydroxychloroquine began as a malaria treatment and became a well-known lupus and arthritis treatment. It's been used uh, very effectively, has a lot of great data for patients within those disease states. Now, President Donald Trump is touting the pill as a possible COVID-19 treatment. Could be a game changer. NBC News reports the FDA fast-tracked the pill for clinical trials. And this week, Congressman Doug Collins tweeted, proud to have worked with Amnil Pharmaceuticals to help secure 200,000 doses of hydroxychloroquine for the Georgia Department of Public Health. Collins' office tells 11 Alive those doses are in addition to Amnil's usual production. Bland says it's too early to tell if the drug could cure COVID-19. Most of the data we have specific to COVID-19 has been very limited. And a lot of the doses that are being evaluated for COVID-19, some of these are higher than what we use for traditional like our rheumatoid arthritis. Increasing possible side effects and the need, Bland says, for the pill to only be used right now with COVID-19 patients being monitored at a hospital. There have been some patients that have had some of those cardiac arrhythmia type side effects and they've had to stop the drug. Mm -hmm. Here are three stories you may have missed today. First, Twitter and Square co-founder Jack Dorsey has pledged a billion dollars to fight against COVID-19. Dorsey announced he would devote the money to help fund relief efforts. He says that amount is about 28% of his net worth. The donation is the biggest contribution by a private donor so far. The virus continues to impact airports nationwide. According to the TSA, fewer than 100,000 people were screened yesterday. The agency says it's a record low. To put that in perspective, on the same date last year, that number was a little more than 2 million. And the number of apartment renters who could not make rent in April fell by 12% people who could make rent, that is, excuse me. According to the National Multifamily Housing Council, 69% of apartment households pay rent through April 5th. That is a 12% decrease from the 81% who pay by March 5th and a 13% decrease from the 82% that paid this time last year. The council's tracker includes data from more than 13 million units across the U.S. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers continuing our conversation here on Facebook Live. Just a few minutes ago, we were up to around more than 700 people. Now we're at about 427. We've been talking about this uh, storm risk as we go through the nighttime hours tonight and then what to expect after the storms roll through. So let me show you what we're watching. Nothing going on here in Atlanta right now. We had a few storms earlier that were well to the south and that was round one that has already moved through and that was mainly on the south side. Now we're watching the beginning of round two and these storms that we're watching coming in from Alabama, they're still well in advance of the main line that is still out to the west. This did prompt severe thunderstorm warning earlier in Huntsville. I want you to watch though. You see the lightning count there around Huntsville, a lot of lightning bolts there. As this moves over between Scottsboro and Fort Payne, we only see a few lightning strikes with this, and that's showing us that this is weakening. And I do think it'll continue to weaken as it gets closer here to parts of uh, Chattooga County and into Floyd County. But that's the beginning of this. But look what's behind it. We have more rain and storms, numerous tornado watches in effect. We have severe thunderstorm warnings, a few tornado warnings with this too. That's what's going to be moving into our area overnight. We do think it's going to be weaker by the time it gets here, but it is possible that some of those storms could hold together uh, to be severe during those overnight hours. So here's a look at what we're watching with those risk areas. We just talked about this a few minutes ago. Here they are again in that tan color that you see up to the north where we have uh, those tornado watches in effect. That is where we have the enhanced risk or the level three of five risk for strong storms as they roll through the area. 
Now you can see that enhanced risk does extend into northwest Georgia. Uh, and then we have the yellow color here, which is the level two of five risk. Damaging winds possible, hail, and even a brief tornado is possible, even though that tornado threat is on the low end. Here's the timeline of what we're watching, and you can see here, uh, not a lot happening here through the evening hours. It's going to be overnight tonight. Here we are at 2 in the morning, still not much going on here, but it'll be after that, let's say between 2 and 4, when Northwest Georgia is going to be feeling these storms moving through, they're going to be approaching the northern metro counties and western metro counties. That sweeps through. This is at 5 in the morning where we're going to see the better coverage of rain moving in through Atlanta and right there along the ID5 corridor. And in those individual cells, there is that potential for the strong storms to roll through. And then as we go into the 6 o'clock hour, these storms on the south side approaching Eatonton down toward Thomaston and then pushing out really quickly. So by the time many of you wake up tomorrow, the storms are already going to be out of here and we'll see improving weather during the day, even though the wind is going to be kicking up back behind this. And that has prompted a wind advisory for North Georgia, Atlanta, and also down over to the east of us. And, and we're not talking about thunderstorm winds. We're just talking about general winds coming in behind this front. They'll be around 20 miles an hour for much of the day and even some wind gusts around 35 miles an hour. That could be strong enough to bring down some small trees or even some tree limbs. And if they hit power lines, that could cause some power power outages. So here's what we're watching for the overnight hours dry until after midnight and then that three o'clock to seven o'clock time frame is when those storms are going to be rolling through. Temperatures will be holding there in the 60s. So on the wasometer tomorrow, early, early in the morning, we have that chance for showers and then it'll be clearing out and turning breezy. We're going to go with a seven on the wasometer. That's our scale from one to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day. Highs up to about 77 degrees. Here's another look. This is another model. The timing on this is a little bit different, but it's still pretty much showing us overnight and early in the morning. This is at seven. Those storms pushing to the south and away and then back behind it. It becomes breezy and temperatures down to 77. Cool Friday morning with lows near 48 degrees and a high of only 64 Friday afternoon. Saturday morning, we're down to 41. That's going to be kind of chilly. Then we get up to 70 in the afternoon. Sunday, another chance for showers and even the potential for some thunder, thunderstorms around on Easter Sunday. We'll be watching for that severe weather threat too. That ends Monday. Then we're dry Tuesday and Wednesday as those temperatures start to come back down to the upper 60s. There are now three coronavirus bills signed into law, but now Congress is discussing their next legislative steps, which includes an interim bill and a second CARES Act. The interim bill would address the new paycheck protection program, which supplies small businesses with a forgivable loan. The first CARES Act provided the program with $350 billion, but now lawmakers are concerned the money will quickly run out due to overwhelming demand. Yesterday, the White House requested an additional $250 billion for that loan program. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says he hopes it can be approved during the next scheduled Senate section on Thursday. Along with those stimulus checks, people are asking about their 401ks. 11 Alive to knew her took some of your questions to our financial expert. 401ks, that's been a big topic of discussion since all of this uh, has been going on. So as far as 401ks go, how is this pandemic impacting them long term? And should people stop contributing uh, for now? Uh, right now, if you are struggling to pay your uh, necessary bills, put food on the table, take care of you and your family, and you're contributing to a 401k, assuming that you're still receiving a paycheck, uh, it may be wise to that you stop contributing for the short term. Right? We're not talking about anything long term, maybe a couple months until all this gets resolved and you'll get back to work and, and life resumes as normal. Uh, so if you need to, you can stop uh, contributing to use that money. Uh, and otherwise, uh, if you need money and your 401k is your sole source of savings, uh, Congress passed with the stimulus bill, uh, allowing folks to be able to withdraw up to $100,000 between now and the end of the year. And with that withdrawal, uh, it'll be penalty free. So the normal 10% early withdrawal penalty will not apply. And you can also defer the taxes for up to three years on whatever the tax liability is going to be for uh, the money you withdraw from your 401k. Next in act of kindness from Tyler Perry to some people who really needed a break during this pandemic. See their reactions next. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station.
today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On An incredible act of generosity this morning is lighting up social media. After Tyler Perry buys the groceries for all of the senior citizens and high risk shoppers at 73 grocery stores, 44 Kroger stores here in Georgia and 29 Winn-Dixie stores in Louisiana. Caitlin Ross reports shoppers were shocked to find out their entire bill was paid. A mask cannot hide this joy. A virus cannot defeat this hope. The tears of joy in the eyes of shoppers this morning shine through the fear of our most vulnerable citizens. In these very uh, troubling, difficult, and sometimes even dark times, um, I think of the Atlanta Angel as a, a bright light who shines. Aaron Swenson's bill was paid at the Togo Hills Kroger this morning. At 7 a.m., no one knew who donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to pay for seniors' groceries, and the store manager wouldn't say a word. And she said, so your groceries are free. <laughs> I still really wouldn't believe her. <laughs> and, and I, you know, I kind of was dumbfounded. And she said, uh, an Atlanta angel uh, is giving you your groceries. Aaron said the expressions of the other shoppers who realized they wouldn't have to worry about how to put food on the table this week were incredible. I looked at all the people in the store who, who were shopping and thought, wow, I, I just wanted to hang around and watch. <laughs> As news spread online of the good deed, Thousands of people speculated it had to be Atlanta media mogul Tyler Perry. Just Monday, he left a $21,000 tip for servers at a local restaurant. The grocery stores later confirming it was him. It's big gestures like that, or even small gestures like smiling at each other, that Aaron says will get us through this. We're not distant from each other. In our daily lives, we are deeply connected. We breathe the same air. And, you know, that's one of the things that it's teaching us. And, you know, I, I hope that we have an opportunity to come out of this uh, better than we were before. An amazing light shows the end of coronavirus, a signal of it after lockdowns in Wuhan, China. But health officials are telling people to be careful moving forward. The latest next. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Prime Time, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. 
For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous. This is a video of an incredible sign of hope as medical staff cheer for Samantha Cook, who was just able to leave the ICU after showing symptoms of COVID-19. She had to be put on a ventilator and nearly died. Pastor Jeremiah Trapman says that people helped prayer services. They held prayer services for her in the hospital parking lot. And after 11 days of being on the ventilator, she started to show signs of improvement. We hope she continues her road to recovery well. Right now, the United States is on an uphill slope of new cases, but after 11 weeks on lockdown, the place where the outbreak started is lifting social distancing restrictions and starting to get back to normal. Jennifer Bellamy on the signs of hope and why Chinese health officials say there is still room for caution moving forward. On the move again, buses and trains ready to roll and people optimistic in Wuhan, China. Tuesday, the country reported no new deaths from COVID-19 in the last 24 hours. And before that, daily deaths had remained in the single digits for weeks. It's welcome news for the people of China that recovery as a nation is possible, but can also signal hope for those watching as our own countries, including the United States, wrestle with the new coronavirus. The World Health Organization says the outbreak began in Wuhan in December of 2019, and now, months later, signs of promise as barriers come down and people look towards a return to normal life. China over the weekend even shipping 82 tons of medical supplies to Spain, a country beginning to see its own drops in infections and deaths. Still, China's National Health Commission is cautioning against getting too far ahead of the process, warning the country still faces a risk of new outbreaks that could come from imported cases. More than 81,000 cases have been confirmed in China, and while Tuesday brought just 32 new ones, they all came from people who had returned to the country from overseas. The number of people dying from coronavirus in the United States continues to rise. Numbers from Johns Hopkins University show more than 3,000 people have died, but there are encouraging signs in some parts of the U.S. They're flattening the curve of new coronavirus cases, according to Dr. Deborah Burks. She warns that this does not mean we are in the clear. It shows staying home and following social distancing guidelines work and are still important. 
What's really important is that people don't turn these early signs of hope into releasing from the 30 days to stop the spread. It's really critical and you can see the delay. So if people start going out again and socially interacting, we could see a very acute second wave very early. So we are really encouraging every American to continue to follow the guidelines for these 30 days. In Georgia, we are still about two weeks away from the estimated peak day for deaths from COVID-19. Our curve is not flat. Cases continue to go up with 1,000 reported in the past 24 hours. We have more on how social distancing can help reduce cases of coronavirus and flatten the curve, the phrase you've heard so often. You can find our article on 11alive.com. And we're watching some of those showers and thunderstorms that are approaching our area. This is the next wave that's going to be moving through. The first one came through and mainly impacted areas on the south side. Now we're watching some of these storms that are coming in from Alabama. Uh, these have some thunder and lightning with them. They're crossing over 59 over near Fort Payne. Uh, for you folks over in Chattooga County, um, I've got some reports earlier on the Facebook Live of folks that are in northwest Georgia hearing thunder and seeing lightning from a distance. That's from this activity that's right over the line into Alabama. This is going to keep moving down into parts of Chattooga County and even into Floyd County. Not classified as severe, just a good uh, shower or a good little storm there with some thunder and lightning, uh, some breezy conditions, windy conditions with that, and uh, some pockets of heavy rain. That's ahead of the main line that is still well out to the west. This is the storm system we're watching. I know this is kind of far away, but this is actually what's going to be moving through during the early morning hours tomorrow. Numerous tornado watches with this, severe thunderstorm warning even a tornado warning with that uh, just to the west of Memphis. Here's a look. Take a look at this on the bigger picture. We've been talking about the risk areas with this, and you can see the enhanced risk, that level three of five risk over uh, Tennessee, Kentucky, southern in Indiana, Illinois, parts of Missouri and Arkansas, and that even extends down into northwest Georgia. Uh, most of us are in the level two risk, that yellow color there, which is the slight risk, meaning there's that potential for some uh, isolated stronger storms during the early morning hours tomorrow damaging wind gust hail and even a brief tornado is possible with this even though we're thinking those tornado risks are going to be on the low end stay with us i'm going to walk you through that timeline with our forecast track model and then let you know what happens after the system moves through we still have an advisory that'll be in effect for much of the day tomorrow we'll talk about that coming up all right, thanks, Chris. You can keep track of this weather by downloading the 11 Alive News app. You'll get severe weather alerts and flash flood warnings sent right to your phone, even if your power goes out. Tonight, the governor is ramping up how the Georgia National Guard are supporting efforts in our state. That includes assisting food banks from Valdosta to Dalton and 36 infected infection control teams helping long-term care facilities. Tracy A. McPeer shows us what the efforts look like in Metro Atlanta. A typical response time for us is anywhere from 6 to 12 hours. We're actively trying to actually crush the curve. So far, Governor Kemp has authorized the activation of 3,000 soldiers in Georgia's National Guard. Colonel Alex McLemore says they are prepared. We've got several response plans that we have uh, Shell, The biological aspect of this is definitely something that we're familiar with. Colonel McLemore is the commander of the 201st Regional Support Division. More than 500 soldiers now serving in Metro Atlanta. These roles come down directly from GEMA. Everything from infection control at nursing homes to unloading supplies at food banks. Filling in wherever there's a need. We've got medical providers that are helping with the medical support teams at some of the hospitals. We've probably got 280 soldiers that are helping clean the local nursing facilities. The same jobs guardsmen are doing across the state for now. I don't think anybody knows what the end in sight is going to look like. You know, the models predict when our, our curve would, will peak or flatten. Uh, and there's a considerable amount of time after that that we think that we'll still be engaged. Supporting their community while responding to their call of duty. This is our state as well. You know, we're neighbors with everybody out there that we're trying to help. A tiger at the Bronx Zoo has tested positive for COVID-19. It's a story getting a lot of tension worldwide because according to the Wildlife Conservation Society, the tiger was infected by an asymptomatic zoo worker. 
The case is prompting pet owners to ask if their cats and dogs may be vulnerable to the virus. NBC's Sarah Delof has the story. The Bronx Zoo has been closed since mid-March, but coronavirus still crept in, infecting a four-year-old Malayan tiger. She was um, test positive. And it surprised everyone because that hadn't been documented before. Zoo officials believe the tiger was exposed by an asymptomatic zoo worker. Six other large cats have similar mild symptoms, including a dry cough. All are expected to recover, but zoos are stepping up safety measures. Workers at the Oakland Zoo now wearing personal protective equipment when within six feet of several animals, including big cats. But right now, experts don't believe your cat or dog is at risk. There's no evidence that uh, people can pass it on to their pets. Uh, there's been several studies and things shown that, and there's not been a single case in the United States, and with all the po thousands of positives, not a single case where a pet has gotten sick yet from a positive person. But the American Veterinary Medical Association says take precautions if you test positive and ask someone else to care for your pet. There's no sense introducing something to them that they may have to deal with, even though they'll probably just form immunity to it uh, and they won't shed it to anybody else. And if you're healthy, keep washing your hands before and after playing with your pet or going for a walk to do all you can to care for your four-legged family members. Both the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the American Veterinary Medical Association says there is no evidence so far that a domestic animal can pass the virus to a human. Calling it a difficult and painful decision, Democratic presidential hopeful Bernie Sanders has officially dropped out of the race for the White House. But in a videotape message to his supporters, Sanders promised their movement and message will continue to be a part of the campaign. NBC's Jay Gray has the latest for us tonight. I have concluded that this battle for the Democratic nomination will not be successful. Bernie Sanders out of the presidential race, but not leaving the process. While this campaign is coming to an end, our movement is not. He says that he'll stay on the ballot in upcoming primaries with the hopes of influencing the party platform and key issues at the now postponed Democratic convention. Then together, standing united, we will go forward to defeat Donald Trump, the most dangerous president in modern American history. President Trump reacting in a series of posts online, taking swipes at Joe Biden, who he calls Sleepy Joe, the Democratic Party, and urging Sanders supporters to come to the Republican Party. In a written statement, Biden thanks Sanders, calling him a powerful voice for a fairer and more just America, reaching out to his supporters and promising the independent will be a part of the path forward, echoing something he said a day earlier on the Today Show. Yeah, I can tell you one thing, I would very much want Bernie to be part of the journey. A journey to the White House that is now a two-man race. Passover started tonight, but the Jewish holiday will look a lot different this year. Next, how one local rabbi is encouraging his community to embrace the change. 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. 
we are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Our Verify team is working nonstop to answer the questions you have about the coronavirus, like this viewer question about the stimulus checks and whether they're coming out of your taxes next year. Our Jason Puckett has the answer. Viewer Lindy Horowitz sent us this question. Quote, is the stimulus check in advance for taxes 2020? We've also received a number of emails wondering if you have to pay taxes on the stimulus checks. So that's what we're verifying. Are the stimulus checks in advance of credit for 2020 taxes? And do you have to pay taxes on them? Our sources are the CARES Act itself and the IRS and U.S. Department of Treasury, along with documentation from Senator Dianne Feinstein. So quick recap, the CARES Act, which passed in late March, includes stimulus money for multiple businesses and a large chunk to help American taxpayers. The bill uses your 2018 or 2019 tax returns to determine if you qualify for a payment based on your income. It basically boils down to this. Adults who filed taxes get $1,200 each and their qualifying children get $500. If your adjusted gross income is over $75,000 individually or $150,000 for joint filings, the amount of that credit decreases up until $99,000 for an individual and $198,000 for a joint filing. Past that, no checks. Okay, so those are the numbers. The big question though, are we gonna have to pay that back? No, the act itself calls these a quote, advance refund. That's a tax credit they're paying you now. Basically the credit lowers the amount of taxes you pay in 2020 and that difference is being sent to you now as a refund. So we can verify you don't have to pay it back. Senator Feinstein's office also confirmed that since it's a tax credit, we don't pay additional taxes on the money. If you've got more questions like this, send us an email. We want to share with you all who are celebrating a happy Passover. The Jewish holiday began at sundown, followed by a traditional dinner known as a cedar. But due to social distancing, this year's celebration may be a bit different from others. A local rabbi explains. One of the things that I've noticed during social distancing is that people are being pretty social with their even extended families. So I assume that a lot of families are going to uh, be using uh, med mediums like Zoom to help them connect with each other. Do the best that you can. Take the take the Passover rituals. Make the best effort that you can, and uh, have a intimate one-on-one -on -one connection with God. If you're on your own, call your siblings, call your friends beforehand, and connect with them. And then have a one-on-one -on -one experience with God. I think for this year, for whatever reason, that seems to be the way God wants it. The impact of social distancing will be felt at the dinner table tonight. Survey USA polled 1,000 people nationwide. 15% say they celebrate Passover. On average, they expect only three people to be there in person for their Seder. That is down from around 4.5% in a typical year. However, 36% expect to have family and friends join the celebration virtually by Zoom, FaceTime, or another type of video chat. 
We're dry in Atlanta right now. We're waiting for this next wave of rain that's going to be moving in overnight, really more toward early, early tomorrow morning. But we have an area of rain coming in from Alabama ahead of that main line. And you can see some of the a little bit of thunderstorm activity with that. Now it's knocking on the door of northwest Georgia. Here's the southern part of uh, Dayton Walker County. Here you see Chattooga County and you see these storms that are moving over Interstate 59 near Fort Payne in Alabama. That's about to cross over the line into Georgia. These are weaker than they were earlier. We've got a couple of lightning strikes with that right now. So just expect in Chattooga County and parts of Floyd County uh, some pockets of heavy rain moving in in a few minutes and maybe some rumbles of thunder and flashes of lightning. The main system is still out to the west. You can see the tornado watches in effect. Much of Tennessee in a tornado watch right now as these storms are now moving through Tennessee. More of that up to the north. We have numerous severe thunderstorm warnings and even a tornado warning still in effect for those areas just to the north and west of Memphis. So we're going to be watching all of this as it continues moving down toward the south and east and that's what's going to be impacting us for the overnight hours and early in the morning hours tomorrow. Here's a look again at those risk areas. I know I'm showing you guys this a lot. First, this is a live look in uh, Floyd County. I have the camera looking toward the west. I know it's a dark sky, but you can see the downtown streets here. But I've been keeping an eye on that just to see if we can see any of that lightning from a distance. I haven't seen much with that right now, but we'll probably see that kind of uh, ramping up a little bit later on. Here's that enhanced risk for Tennessee, Kentucky, southern parts of Indiana, Illinois, uh, parts of southeastern Missouri and northeastern Arkansas. That's a level three of five risk, and that's where all those storms are happening right now. We do think those storms are going to weaken a little bit as they move into our area, but still some will hold together to give us the potential for damaging wind gusts. Hail is possible and a brief tornado is possible early in the morning as well, and that's why we're in that slight risk or level two of five risk. Here is that timeline. This model continues to update, so here's the latest that we have. You can see at two in the morning, still nothing going on. On. So when you go to bed tonight, things are going to be fine for you to get to sleep. It's just going to be in the middle of the night and really early in the morning when you need to have a way that you can get some warnings, whether it's from our 11 Alive app. Just make sure and enable the alerts and so it'll alert you if any store, if any warnings are issued overnight or if you have a National Weather Service radio. Turn that on tonight, program it so that it's uh, for your county and the counties around you. This is at four in the morning. Storms over North Georgia still not into Atlanta yet. They'll be moving through and approaching Atlanta, let's say between four and five in the morning, right there along the ID5 corridor, and some of these cells can be strong, and then moving down toward the south and east. And I do think they're gonna weaken as they move to the south and east as well. This is at six in the morning, and then continuing to push away. So behind this front, after the storms move through, we're still gonna have something else that I want you to be aware of during the day tomorrow, and that's gonna be really windy conditions here behind this front where we have uh, the, the northwest winds at about 20 miles an hour. Some of those wind gusts that will be around 35 miles an hour, that can be enough to bring down some trees, maybe some tree limbs, and even cause some power outages in some spots if those tree limbs fall on any power lines. That's gonna be from eight in the morning until eight in the evening. Excuse me, just expect some uh, really breezy conditions out there. 71 degrees, lower 70s through around 11 o'clock tonight. And then in those overnight hours, this is when you see those storms that'll be moving through pretty quickly, ending early in the morning, then clearing out and rather breezy though during the day on Thursday. Highs, I do think we'll still get into the 70s tomorrow. Not as warm as we were today when we got into the lower 80s. Uh, seven on the wasometer, that's our scale from one to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day. And the rain ends really early, so it's not gonna be a rainy day tomorrow, just really early in the morning, a couple of those showers around. Here's another look at the timeline. This model, actually slows this down a little bit. This shows it not going through Atlanta until about six to seven in the morning and then pushing down to the south very quickly with those northwest winds here back behind the system. So here's what we're watching uh, through the day on Thursday. We're gonna have uh, nice conditions, but breezy Friday, partly cloudy skies and cool with highs only in the 60s in the afternoon on Friday. Here's the seven day outlook. We're gonna be uh, at 64 Friday, 70 on Saturday. That's after a chilly start though, Saturday morning down to 41, even 30s in the outlying areas. Sunday, another round of rain and even the potential for severe weather on Easter Sunday. We'll keep you posted on that as we get closer to it to try to fine, t fine tune the timing and impacts. Rain ends Monday and then we're dry Tuesday and Wednesday, a little cooler as well with high temperatures trending back down into the upper 60s. All right, so a lot of college athletic programs make their money off football, especially smaller schools such as Georgia State and Kennesaw State. Alex Glaze tells us what's on the line if their seasons are cut short.
One of the ways mid-major schools make money is by playing money games. Those are games where small schools play for guaranteed money to participate in games against bigger schools. Last year, Tennessee paid Georgia State $900,000 to play a football game. This year, Georgia State is scheduled to play Alabama for $1.3 million. So what happens if that game's unable to be played? If the game's not played, it's played in September. We've got a full you know, year from a business standpoint to, to reallocate resources or to try to replicate that revenue. The solution isn't so simple for other schools. Morehouse is projecting to make close to $300,000 this year by playing in three classics. In the HBCU world, those are things that are kind of the, the revenue generators for us. We don't get the TV deals like the SEC network, ACC network. We don't, we don't have those type of partnerships. If those games can't happen, they won't be paid. Well, it's not the loss of that revenue would, would take away a lot of opportunities that we are planning. When it comes to television deals and mid-major schools, the revenue is by and large minimal. At Kennesaw State, they receive around $50,000 from a deal that the Big South and ASUN Conference have with ESPN. We're more uh, heavily relied on the university and student fees. Small schools also rely a lot on philanthropy. And as Americans continue to lose their jobs during this global pandemic, the facts are some simply can't afford to donate right now. Right now, it, you know, rightfully so, all families should be focused on uh, making sure that their families are good. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam. We are tracking those storms that will be moving through overnight and really early tomorrow morning, and then they will move out. It'll turn breezy, though, tomorrow with a wind advisory in effect with the sunshine returning. Highs near 77. Friday cooler, 64 for high with mostly sunny skies. Chilly Saturday morning with a low of 41 and a high of 70. The rain moves back on Sunday and the potential for some strong storms once again. That ends early Monday, and then we cool off again, this time into the upper 60s for Tuesday and Wednesday with those partly cloudy skies. All right, Chris and I are going to see you over on our sister station, 11 Alive, for Up Late coming up at 11, but stick around. More news and weather coming up here on Prime Time at 10.
Live, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. New tonight at 10, how donating blood after recovering from COVID-19 could save lives. Plus Zoom bombing, how cyber criminals could hack your business calls while you work from home. What you can do to protect yourself. But first, we begin tonight with the decision to keep us home in Georgia for at least the end of the month. That's what Governor Kemp announced today during a shelter in place news conference order to try to keep people away from each other in an effort to try to slow down the pandemic. Yeah, Jeff, and he's cracking down on nursing homes and other long term care facilities where so many vulnerable COVID-19 patients are dying by the dozens. John Sherrick begins our coverage tonight. Governor Brian Kemp saying Georgians are mostly complying with the stay at home order and extending it to April 30th will, he says, give it a chance to work to flatten the curve. And I don't want Georgians to take their foot off the gas. There's no question what we're doing is working. But long term care facilities, nursing homes across Georgia reporting dozens of COVID-19 deaths so far among seniors, the most vulnerable. The governor ordering them to observe strict sanitation protocols, and he's sending in an additional 1,000 Georgia National Guard members to clean them up. The Georgia Department of Public Health Commissioner, Dr. Kathleen Toomey, says the executive order empowers health officials to enforce consistent infection controls. And so we see this as an opportunity to be proactive in this area and to ensure that no new cases of 
occur. Governor Kemp trying to beef up hospital capacity to be ready for the projected peak of cases, possibly around April 20th, and trying to look ahead to an end to all of this. Now, when the end is, I think it depends on how people continue to do. Uh, if people continue to, to practice this new norm of social distancing, it'll be sooner rather than later. But not, he says, this month. Right now, there are more than 10,000 confirmed cases in Georgia. The state health department reports 369 people have died from COVID-19. The State Department of Health now is trying to break down these cases by race here in Georgia. And this comes after multiple cities, big cities, Chicago, Philadelphia, Detroit, have reported high rates of infections and deaths among African Americans. Here in Georgia, the health commissioner says we have a lot more information we have to learn about this issue of how people are getting the virus. We're certainly seeing higher rates in places like Albany, and but because the, the data are, are so inconsistent, we have as many as 60% of our cases without that racial data. So it's hard to make a, a, a firm analysis without consistent data. And according to the latest Department of Health data, 21% of confirmed cases in Georgia are in the African-American community. But you see what Dr. Toomey was talking about. The race has not been reported in 63% of those cases. New tonight, updated guidance from the CDC that will allow some to return to work. The agency hopes to speed up the return of employees in critical or essential jobs like health care, first responders and food suppliers. The new guidelines say these workers who were exposed to a confirmed or suspected coronavirus case can go back to work if they do not have symptoms to do so. They must take their temperatures before going in, wear face masks and practice social distancing on the job. As far as the overall picture goes, President Trump continues to be optimistic as he looks ahead to the coming weeks and months. No, we want to go back to life. Now, the first period of time, maybe we'll go a little bit slower and maybe we'll be talking about distancing. But at some point, we expect to be back like it was before. We also have new numbers from our survey USA polling. They asked 1000 Americans their confidence level in President Trump leading the nation through these trying times. 43% say they are confident. 48% say they're not. It is a 14 point turn downward from two weeks ago when 50% had confidence and 41% did not. We are tracking storms that are on our way to the area, and right now we are dry. We see a few showers in North Georgia, but this is well ahead of that main line that is still out to the west. Here's what we're watching right now. Rome, you most likely are seeing some lightning in the distance, maybe hearing some thunder from this lightning here that is over parts of Chattooga County right now and on back into Alabama. These storms are not classified as severe, just some good heavy rain with some thunder and lightning. This is well ahead of the main area of rain. This is a look at a tornado watch over much of Tennessee. Here some, are some storms with some severe thunderstorm warnings with them, and then even more on up to the north as well where we have numerous tornado watches in effect. This system is moving our way overnight mainly toward really early tomorrow morning. Let's take a look at the risk areas where you see those tornado watches. That's where we have the enhanced risk. You can see in Rome as we're looking live toward the west. Don't see any lightning strikes out there right now. There is that enhanced risk over Tennessee, Kentucky, Missouri, Arkansas and Illinois and Indiana. That enhanced risk comes down into northwest Georgia. We're in the yellow color. That's the slight risk or level two of five risk. And in these areas tonight, overnight, we have the potential for some uh, isolated, stronger storms with damaging winds, hail, brief tornado on the low end, but it's still possible. We'll talk about that specific timing for you coming up in just a few minutes. Right now, scientists are looking for people who have contracted COVID-19, have suffered, and then they have recovered. The antibodies in their blood is one of the most valuable elements on the planet right now because it can help develop vaccines in testing and treatment. Our very own 11 Alive investigator Andy Parati recently donated his blood after contracting and recovering from the virus. Yeah. It's 16 days after I first experienced COVID-19 symptoms and my doctor Nicholas Boyu believes I fully recovered. 
He runs the Highland Urgent Care in Atlanta. So we're gonna keep it. You no longer harbor this because you'll have immunity, and then you'll know. So okay. You definitely want to Make sure he gives me another test. Okay, keep your head back. This is the fun part, right? Inserting a six-inch long Q-tip up my nasal right. cavity in search of a sample. Okay. There's gray matter on the end of that. That's what we're looking for. Oh, man. It's like tickling your brain. The results should come back in a few days. I fully expect you to be negative. You're two weeks out. And like I said, you are a valuable commodity now. A valuable commodity because Dr. Bayou says the antibodies in my blood could hold the key to a potential vaccine, a new test, or treatment for the coronavirus. The fact that you've recovered from the illness and you're no longer febrile means you, your body had gained the upper hand. The only way it would have done that would have been on a healthy immune response where you develop antibodies against it. Dr. Bayou then draws my blood. Okay. He'll submit a sample to a private lab, which will then use my plasma to identify the antibodies. The tube right here um, is gonna have antibodies against COVID one of the most valuable things on the planet right now. Using antibodies is not new. It's an age-old treatment used for decades to develop therapies which have been used to fight diseases like Ebola. So if the virus looks like this, your body is going to build an antibody against it. If it looks like that, like a lock and key. Mm -hmm. Now it's identified this as a foreign particle. Other elements of the immune system will come in to destroy the virus. Because we want the structure of that antibody because we cannot produce anything nearly as well as your body can that can fight this virus as that antibody. This past Monday, my test results returned and showed no signs of the virus. The American Red Cross is in the process of establishing a program to allow recovered patients to donate their plasma. If you're interested in donating, you can sign up using a link posted in this story on 11alive.com. Cyber attacks against hospitals, believe it or not, are increasing. It is a maddening way of trying to rip off many of these uh, hospitals across the world. Hope Ford talked to a cyber expert about how hackers are trying to make profits right now, and they are do so, doing so at potentially the cost of life. Warning, this is a hack. Your device has been taken over and will self-destruct in three, two, one. This is an exaggeration. Something you might have seen in a bad 1980s movie. But this is real life, a pandemic. A lot different in the world, except one seedy thing. When it comes to the cyber world and the hacker world, nothing has changed. Hackers targeting hospitals during a critical period and you while you're working at home. When the UK reached their peak last month, hackers targeted a London-based medical company carrying out trials for COVID-19 vaccines. It's happening in the US as well, and hospitals are turning to cyber companies to protect them. We have confirmed that they have attacked healthcare services and hospitals that are in states that are really heavily affected by COVID-19. Maya Levine is a security engineer with the cybersecurity company Checkpoint Software. She can't tell us which hospitals were hit for privacy reasons, but the reason they're targeted, money, no honor amongst thieves. I'm going to lock you out of files or systems or things that you need to do your business so that you have to pay me money. It's happened before. Back in 2018, hackers sent ransomware attacks to Atlanta, interrupting city operations. Yeah, the city of Atlanta's computers are being held hostage. And last year, the FBI reports 140 attacks targeting state and local governments and healthcare providers. To lock down a hospital, is potentially harming the lives of people that are in the hospital. Hackers also go after the healthcare profession to get medical records, which sell for the highest profit on the dark web. A lot of the information in medical records can be used for identity fraud. And with millions working from home, hackers are going after you too. In a move called Zoom bombing, hackers aren't targeting you for your money, but they're doing it for fun or to listen in on virtual meetings to get info about a company they can share. Assume that what happens in Zoom does not stay in Zoom. Protect yourself by updating your software, using passwords for Zoom meetings, and only letting authorized users into your meeting. For emails, use a link checker like Virus Desk. You enter the link you were sent in an email, and this tool scans the link, telling you if it's from a trusted source. Sure, there are extra steps, but they can help protect you from Warning. that. Warning. 
New developments tonight, a local family is now home after they were trapped in the world's largest lockdown. Check out this adorable video of Michael and Whitney Seville's sons the moment they met their new sister, Grace. The Seville's went to India earlier in March to bring home their adopted daughter. But the Prime Minister of India called for the entire country to be locked down. They spent more than a week in a hotel with their new daughter, but thankfully the family was able to catch a flight with personnel from the State Department. They're looking forward to their new life all together. Well, are the stimulus checks many Americans are set to receive coming out of your taxes next year? We're verifying next. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought. Our Verify team is working nonstop to answer the questions you have about the coronavirus, like one viewer's question about those stimulus checks and whether they're coming out of your taxes next year. Our Jason Puckett has the answer. Viewer Lindy Horowitz sent us this question. Quote, is the stimulus check in advance for taxes 2020? We've also received a number of emails wondering if you have to pay taxes on the stimulus checks. So that's what we're verifying. Are the stimulus checks in advance of credit for 2020 taxes? And do you have to pay taxes on them? Our sources are the CARES Act itself and the IRS and US Department of Treasury, along with documentation from Senator Dianne Feinstein. So quick recap, the CARES Act, which passed in late March, includes stimulus money for multiple businesses and a large chunk to help American taxpayers. The bill uses your 2018 or 2019 tax returns to determine if you qualify for a payment based on your income. It basically boils down to this. Adults who filed taxes get $1,200 each and their qualifying children get $500. If your adjusted gross income is over $75,000 individually or $150,000 for joint filings, the amount of that credit decreases up until $99,000 for an individual and $198,000 for a joint filing. Past that, no checks. Okay, so those are the numbers. The big question though, are we gonna have to pay that back? No, the act itself calls these a quote, advance refund. That's a tax credit they're paying you now. Basically the credit lowers the amount of taxes you pay in 2020 and that difference is being sent to you now as a refund. So we can verify you don't have to pay it back. Senator Feinstein's office also confirmed that since it's a tax credit, we don't pay additional taxes on the money. If you've got more questions like this, send us an email. We're keeping an eye on one round of storms that's coming out of Alabama, crossing over the line into northwest Georgia. You can see it right here. It is not classified as severe, but it does have some thunder and lightning with it and pockets of heavy rain and some gusty winds along with it, too. It is now south of Dayton Walker County, right here into parts of Chattooga County. It's about to move. Actually, it's crossing over the line into northern Floyd, really close to Armurchie. This is north and west of the Rome area. I just did a lightning count on this. We have about seven lightning strikes in the past 15 minutes. Uh, some of this is back into Alabama. Some of the lightning is right here in northwest Georgia. This is going to keep moving down toward the south and the east. So Rome, you're going to be seeing this in just a little bit. It may make it down into Cartersville in a little while. 
but this is just really one lone cell ahead of the main line that's still well out to the west. You can see these storms moving through Tennessee. We have a tornado watch that covers much of Tennessee and then additional tornado watches for Kentucky, southern parts of Illinois, uh, Indiana and Illinois, also into parts of Missouri and Arkansas. Numerous severe thunderstorm warnings with that, even a tornado warning now just to the south of the Cincinnati area. These storms roll toward us tonight and we will have the potential for severe weather here during the overnight hours toward tomorrow morning. We do think that the storms will be weaker by the time they make it here than they are up in the, the Midwest right now, but still strong enough to potentially cause uh, some damaging winds. So here's a look at those risk areas. We've been talking about this all night, that enhanced risk, which is a level three of five risk. That's the tan color you see there in parts of Tennessee, Kentucky, Indiana, Illinois, uh, Arkansas, and Missouri. And that even extends down into far northwest Georgia. Here in the rest of North Georgia, metro Atlanta, down into central and south Georgia, the yellow color is indicating the slight risk or the level two of five risk. In these areas, it is still possible to have some isolated or scattered stronger storms with damaging wind gusts, hail possible, and and a brief tornado is a possibility as well. We do think the tornado risk, though, is on the low end. So here's the timing. I know these overnight storms are not fun when you're trying to go to sleep, but I actually think you'll be able to get to sleep tonight. No problem. It's just going to be during the overnight hours and really toward tomorrow morning when we see those storms at two o'clock. Nothing. All right. Then you see by uh, four in the morning, these showers and storms in northwest Georgia. As we get to about five o'clock in the morning, these are closing in on Atlanta, but still on the north side. They swim through the area between five and six o'clock, and then they're east of us and south of us at six. And then by seven, they're down to the south where we start to clear out and also uh, dry out tomorrow. But behind the system, this front, it's going to be windy. We have a wind advisory in effect with winds 20 miles an hour, some gusts to 35. That could bring down some trees, maybe cause some power outages there. So a rather breezy day tomorrow, highs near 77. Uh, 64 on Friday, so it's going to be cool. And then Saturday morning, chilly, down to 41 with 30s in the outlying areas. And then rain moves back Sunday. Storms are possible with that, maybe severe weather ending Monday. And then dry Tuesday and Wednesday with highs in the 60s. Here's a look at your uh, weather wow moment for the night. And this is a, these are a lot of pictures that we've compiled from our 11 Alive Community Storm Trackers of last night's super moon. Just take a look at all of those. So it was nice to view that. We are so appreciative of our, of our 11 Alive Community Storm Trackers. We would love for you to be a part of that group on Facebook. Just search 11 Alive Storm Trackers. Ask to become a member of that closed group. We'll let you in, we'll approve it, and then you can be a part of this exclusive weather community where we share weather information, videos, and pictures. Well, your social media chatter can tell researchers a lot about how the coronavirus is spreading. Natisha Lance shows us how. Georgia State researchers are collecting and monitoring 4 million tweets every day. So far, 180 million tweets have been collected since March using popular words like positive coronavirus, tested positive, and coronavirus outbreak. We're trying to, you know, identify who's self-identifying as, you know, that have been cured, who's self-identifying that they have symptoms to see if we can actually track, you know, from this very limited data, uh, those kinds of things, and then link them to more, you know, social movement and socioeconomic factors. Researchers hope the tweets will also provide information on treatment, displacement, and give a historical record of the pandemic's timing. They collected similar data during the Zika outbreak. Here's an interesting nugget about the data and social distancing. So researchers say the information can show how people are following those guidelines based on how they talk about it and how they register movement based on how they tag their tweet locations. The coronavirus pandemic is impacting how Many people practice their religion. Up next, what Passover looks like for many Jewish families across the world. Coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters. We want to wish all who are celebrating a happy Passover. The Jewish holiday begins at sundown and is followed by a traditional dinner known as a Seder. But due to social distancing, this year's celebration may be different from others. A local rabbi explains. One of the things that I've noticed during social distancing is that people are being pretty social with their even extended families. So I assume that a lot of families are going to uh, be using uh, med uh, mediums like Zoom to help them connect with each other. Do the best that you can. Take the, take the Passover rituals. Make the best effort that you can and uh, have a intimate one-on-one -on -one connection with God if you're on your own. Call your siblings, call your friends beforehand and connect with them, and then have a one-on-one -on -one experience with God. I think for this year, for whatever reason, that seems to be the way God wants it. The impact of social distancing will be felt at the dinner table tonight. Survey USA polled 1,000 people nationwide. 15% say they celebrate Passover. On average, they expect only three people to be there in person for their Seder. That is down from around 4.5% in a typical year. However, 36% expect to have family and friends join the celebration virtually by Zoom, FaceTime, or another type of video chat. I just saw some on Zoom on my Instagram. Well, it's time for me to head out to get ready for Up Late coming up on 11 Alive at 11 p.m. If you're an Up Later, Chris and I will see you there, Jeff. All right, Aisha, we will look for you on 11 Alive in about 30 minutes or so. Coming up here on the Big 36, a lot of information to pass along to you. An amazing light showing the end of coronavirus lockdowns in Wuhan, China. But health officials there are telling people to be very careful moving forward. We'll have the very latest for you coming up next. Sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. ago, a DeKalb County father was not feeling well and believed that he had coronavirus. He was able to go to the hospital and he was able to walk in under his own power. But it has all changed. In 72 hours, he was fighting for his life. Elvin Lopez spoke to the mother of his children today. Like I wake up sometimes and I'm like, oh God, that was a horrible nightmare. And then I realize that, no, <laughs> this is our life right now. Annalisa Silliman says she still considers her ex-husband, Matt Lindsay, to be like family. The 48-year-old is the father of her four children. When the cases of COVID-19 started to rise in Georgia, she says she mainly worried about her elderly parents. I mean, we thought maybe one of us would get sick because, you know, but not, not, not sick. But it was Matt who walked into Emory Hospital Saturday suffering from COVID-19 symptoms. Just a day later, she says she got a call saying he was fighting for his life and that he was the sickest patient with the virus in the hospital. He's intubated. He's on a ventilator. He's in a coma. They put him in a coma. He's, they, they've purposely paralyzed him so that he won't fight against the machine. Grieving the inability to be by his side while he's in the ICU as she also try to comfort their children the best she can. To not be able to hold your children when their dad is suffering and maybe dying is, is a pain that is just <sighs> unfathomable. She says she's witnessed firsthand the virus doesn't discriminate by age. Yet she says she continues to see people out and about socializing and wants it to stop. It's selfish and it's People, people are not taking it seriously. There are some encouraging signs that uh, the, the curve is starting to be flattened in some places in the United States. This according to Dr. Deborah Burks, who is on the White House Coronavirus Task Force. But she warns it does not mean that we are in the clear. A state like Georgia, we are a long way away from flattening that curve. It shows that staying home and following social distancing certainly can work. What's really important is that people don't turn these early signs of hope into releasing from the 30 days to stop the spread. It's really critical and you can see the delay. So if people start going out again and socially interacting, we could see a very acute second wave very early. So we are really encouraging every American to continue to follow the guidelines for these 30 days. The number of people dying from coronavirus in the United States also continues to rise. 
Numbers from Johns Hopkins University show that more than 13,000 people have died. In China, strict measures put in place 11 weeks ago are now being lifted. And the government there is telling us that it has begun to stabilize. But as Jennifer Bellamy explains, health officials are still urging people in China to be very careful. On the move again, buses and trains ready to roll and people optimistic in Wuhan, China. Tuesday, the country reported no new deaths from COVID-19 in the last 24 hours. And before that, daily deaths had remained in the single digits for weeks. It's welcome news for the people of China that recovery as a nation is possible, but can also signal hope for those watching as our own countries, including the United States, wrestle with the new coronavirus. The World Health Organization says the outbreak began in Wuhan in December of 2019, and now, months later, signs of promise as barriers come down and people look towards a return to normal life. China over the weekend even shipping 82 tons of medical supplies to Spain, a country beginning to see its own drops in infections and deaths. Still, China's National Health Commission is cautioning against getting too far ahead of the process, warning the country still faces a risk of new outbreaks that could come from imported cases. More than 81,000 cases have been confirmed in China, and while Tuesday brought just 32 new ones, they all came from people who had returned to the country from overseas. We have more on how social distancing can help reduce cases of coronavirus and flatten the curve. That phrase that we have all come to know very well by now. You can find our article on 11alive.com. And along with stimulus checks, as we go from the medical aspect to uh, economic talk, people are asking about their 401ks, particularly people that are, say, over a certain age as they get closer to cashing them in. 11alive's Chenu Her took some of your questions to financial expert Andrew Poulos. 401ks, that's been a big topic of discussion since all of this uh, has been going on. So as far as 401ks go, how is this pandemic impacting them long term? And should people stop contributing uh, for now? Uh, right now, if you are struggling to pay your uh, necessary bills, put food on the table, take care of you and your family, and you're contributing to a 401k as someone that can still receive a paycheck, uh, it may be wise too that you stop contributing for the short term, right? We're not talking about anything long term, maybe a couple months until all this gets resolved and you'll get back to work and, and life resumes as normal. Uh, so if you need to, you can stop uh, contributing to use that money. Uh, and otherwise, uh, if you need money and your 401k is your sole source of savings, uh, Congress passed with the stimulus bill, uh, allowing folks to be able to withdraw up to $100,000 between now and the end of the year. And with that withdrawal, uh, it'll be penalty free. So the normal 10% early withdrawal penalty will not apply. And you can also defer the taxes for up to three years on whatever the tax liability is going to be for uh, the money you withdraw from your 401k. There is so much information that rolls in during the course of the day and night on COVID-19. Here are three stories that you may have missed. Let's get you updated right now. Twitter and Square co-founder Jack Dorsey has pledged $1 billion to fight against COVID-19. Mr. Dorsey announced he would devote the money to help fund relief efforts. He says that amount is about 28 percent of his net worth. The donation is the biggest contribution by a private donor so far. The virus continues to impact the nation's airports. According to the TSA, fewer than 100,000 people were screened yesterday. The agency says it is a record low. To put that in perspective, on the same date last year, the number was a little more than 2 million. And the number of apartment renters who could make rent in April, who might not make their rent in April, fell by 12 percent. According to the National Multifamily Housing Council, 69 percent of apartment households paid rent through April 5th. That's a 12 percent decrease from the 81 percent who paid March 5th and a 13 percent decrease from the, the uh, 82 percent that paid this time last year. The council's tracker includes data for more than 13 million units across the United States. Tonight, the governor is ramping up how Georgia and the National Guard are supporting efforts along the state. Now, this will include assisting food banks from Valdosta to Dalton, from south all the way to north, east to west. And 36 infection control teams are helping long-term care facilities. Tracy Amick-Pierre shows us what the effort looks like here 
in Metro Atlanta. A typical response time for us is anywhere from six to 12 hours. We're actively trying to actually crush the curve. So far, Governor Kemp has authorized the activation of 3,000 soldiers in Georgia's National Guard. Colonel Alex McLemore says they are prepared. We've got several response plans that we have uh, Shell, The biological aspect of this is definitely something that we're familiar with. Colonel McLemore is the commander of the 201st Regional Support Division. More than 500 soldiers now serving in Metro Atlanta. These roles come down directly from GEMA. Everything from infection control at nursing homes to unloading supplies at food banks. Filling in wherever there's a need. We've got medical providers that are helping with the medical support teams at some of the hospitals. We've probably got 280 soldiers that are helping clean the local nursing facilities. The same jobs guardsmen are doing across the state for now. I don't think anybody knows what the end in sight is going to look like. You know, the models predict when our, our curve would, will peak or flatten. Uh, and there's a considerable amount of time after that that we think that we'll still be engaged. Supporting their community while responding to their call of duty. This is our state as well. You know, we're neighbors with everybody out there that we're trying to help. In a videotape message to his supporters, Senator Bernie Sanders today has decided to call an end to his campaign for the presidency. He said that it was a very difficult decision for him to make. But he wants to be a part of the campaign toward the fall. NBC's Jay Gray has the very latest for us tonight. I have concluded that this battle for the Democratic nomination will not be successful. Bernie Sanders out of the presidential race, but not leaving the process. While this campaign is coming to an end, our movement is not. He says that he'll stay on the ballot in upcoming primaries with the hopes of influencing the party platform and key issues at the now postponed Democratic Convention. Then together, standing united, we will go forward to defeat Donald Trump, the most dangerous president in modern American history. President Trump reacting in a series of posts online, taking swipes at Joe Biden, who he calls Sleepy Joe, the Democratic Party, and urging Sanders supporters to come to the Republican Party. In a written statement, Biden thanks Sanders, calling him a powerful voice for a fairer and more just America, reaching out to his supporters and promising the independent will be a part of the path forward, echoing something he said a day earlier on the Today Show. Yeah, I can tell you one thing, I would very much want Bernie to be part of the journey. A journey to the White House that is now a two-man race. We'll lead with science. Listen to the I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. Nothing going on in Atlanta right now, but just up the road, up 75 in northwest Georgia, we're tracking some showers and thunderstorms. A lot of lightning with this, and this isn't even the part that's going to give us a severe weather threat overnight tonight. We'll show you that and run you through the timeline of your best chances of seeing strong storms. Coming up, the Falcons' new uniforms creating a stir on social media. If you want to cause a, a very divisive issue, it's changing uniforms. Everybody's got an opinion. We'll have the real story behind their design coming up in sports. Footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. 
There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. Thousands of grocery shoppers were shocked, surprised, and they were happy as could be when they discovered that someone, an anonymous someone, had paid for all of their groceries today. First, they were told it was a gift from an Atlanta angel. The term Atlanta angel generally is, uh, you know, that's, that's Tyler Perry, and that's exactly who it was. Mr. Perry covered the bill for elderly, vulnerable shoppers at about 70 stores here in our state and in Louisiana. As Caitlin Ross reports, it was a happy morning. Oh my God. Yes, really? yes, he did. It was the best surprise for elderly shoppers trying to get their groceries before the rush this morning. I went around and filled up my cart with more than what I would normally get. Aaron Swenson was trying to limit trips to the grocery store. It totaled up to $70 and 52 cents. Erin couldn't believe it. She bagged my groceries and she said, um, have you heard what's happening? And, and, and pessimistic me thought, uh-oh, there's something more going on. And she smiled and she said, no, there's an, there's an anonymous donor who has, who has decided to pay for all of the seniors' groceries. Online, people quickly speculated media mogul Tyler Perry was behind the good deed. Just days ago, he left a $21,000 tip for servers at Atlanta restaurant. The grocery stores later confirming it was him. While Win Dixie and Kroger didn't have a total for all of the groceries cost, Aaron says Perry's act of kindness is priceless. In these very uh, troubling, difficult, and sometimes even dark times, um, I think of the Atlanta Angel as a, a bright light who shines. Mr. Perry is ever an amazing man. What, what a wonderful act. A tiger at the Bronx Zoo is tested positive for COVID-19. It is a story getting a lot of attention worldwide because, according to the Wildlife Conservation Society, the tiger was infected by a symptomatic zoo worker. So this case is prompting a lot of pet owners around the country and around the world, for matter, to pay very close attention about your dog or your cat. Could they be vulnerable to the virus? Here's NBC's Sarah Dolliff. The Bronx Zoo has been closed since mid-March, but coronavirus still crept in, infecting a four-year-old Malayan tiger. She was um, test positive, and it surprised everyone because that hadn't been documented before. 
Zoo officials believe the tiger was exposed by an asymptomatic zoo worker. Six other large cats have similar mild symptoms, including a dry cough. All are expected to recover, but zoos are stepping up safety measures. Workers at the Oakland Zoo now wearing personal protective equipment when within six feet of several animals, including big cats. But right now, experts don't believe your cat or dog is at risk. There's no evidence that uh, people can pass it on to their pets. Uh, there's been several studies and things shown that, and there's not been a single case in the United States, and with all the po thousands of positives, not a single case where a pet has gotten sick yet from a positive person. But the American Veterinary Medical Association says take precautions if you test positive and ask someone else to care for your pet. There's no sense introducing something to them that they may have to deal with, even though they'll probably just form immunity to it uh, and they won't shed it to anybody else. And if you're healthy, keep washing your hands before and after playing with your pet or going for a walk to do all you can to care for your four-legged family members. We're keeping a close eye on these storms in northwest Georgia. They're bearing down on Rome right now in Floyd County. These aren't severe, but we have some heavy rain with this and some thunder and lightning. We've been tracking these as they've been coming out of Alabama. They weakened somewhat in Alabama, but now they're ramping back up. We're watching the uh, uh, the lightning count with this come up a little bit. You can see them as they have moved through Chattooga County. Now they're over uh, Floyd County, moving through parts of southern Gordon County, also moving into Bartow County. County here in the northwestern part, just to the north and west of Cartersville. You can see about 17 lightning strikes in the past 15 minutes out of this system. Again, not classified as severe, no hail with this. We do have some winds with it, but not, you know, severe levels. And it's well in advance of this main line. This is the severe weather threat that's back into Tennessee. That still has a long way to go before it pushes into our area, really overnight tonight and into the morning hours. There's a tornado watch in effect for much of Tennessee. Tennessee. Also another one in Kentucky and then also in the southern parts of Murray, uh, Missouri as well. And all, all of that is pushing down toward the south and east. But still going to take a little while before that to get here. Take a look right now at what we're watching. This is a live look up in Rome. We've been checking this out over the past hour. The last time we looked at this, it was dry, but now you can see the downtown streets. Uh, there was a little bit of lightning there too. I've been kind of watching the sky there for any lightning strikes. You can see some of that in the distance. The downtown streets are wet at this hour too from that rain that is moving through. We have that enhanced risk up to our north and it even includes parts of northwest Georgia. Most of us are in this yellow color, which is the level two of five risk. And as these storms come in overnight, there's the potential for some damaging winds, hail possibility, and even a brief tornado, even though that tornado risk is on the low end. Here's an update on the timing. This model updates uh, pretty often here, and you can see that the by 2 o'clock in the morning, still that line is not moving into northwest Georgia. It's really going to be between 3 and 4 as that moves into northwest Georgia. By 5 o'clock, bearing down on the city of Atlanta from 5 to 6, moving through Atlanta, and then pushing down to the south. And then behind this, we're going to clear out during the day tomorrow, but it's going to be really windy and we have a wind advisory in effect with high temperatures up to 77 degrees. Those winds at times gusting up to 35 miles an hour. Cooler Friday, mostly sunny skies in 64. Saturday morning, rather chilly down to 41 degrees uh, with a high of 70. Showers and storms return on Sunday, ending on Monday, then drying out again Tuesday and Wednesday and back to the 60s. New Atlanta Falcon Todd Gurley is certainly familiar with our great state. So he is doing his part for COVID-19 relief, partnering with Hungry at Home to donate meals to hospitals and those in need to the area. You see many people delivering them on his behalf, and it is a nice gesture, a good way for him to begin his stay as the newest member of the Atlanta Falcons. After getting leaked on social media last night, the Falcons went ahead and they released the, the new uniforms, the new jerseys, as we have seen. And uh, it has been something to talk about. Everybody has an opinion on uniforms. Nobody seems to agree on it ever. On social media, a decidedly mixed review, of course. Many wanting more of a throwback look. I'm one of those. But these are clean. They are sharp, certainly red and black and white. And the jersey is good looking, too. ATL prominent on the front with uh, a New Jersey font. Not New Jersey as in Bayonne, but a new <laughs> Jersey. Falcons believe this look represents the city better. We went through 
hundreds of iterations. And so when we thought about keeping it simple, but also staying true to Atlanta, we came up with that ATL, and that was something that our fans really were they're excited about. ATL, it's three letters known around the world. Why shouldn't we use it as a badge of pride for all of us to help bring people together? Yeah, it'll be a big hit. They'll sell a lot of those, and that's what it's all about. The NBA is not back, but a few players are going to be competing in a socially distant game of horse. Trey Young among those expected to compete, along with other NBA and WNBA stars. Maybe a few legends, too. They will pull off a little old-school game, but we're not quite sure how that's going to be. We're going to have to wait and see how it all plays out. And we continue to honor some of the high school athletes of 2020, the seniors who didn't get to finish their seasons because of the pandemic. Today and tonight, we have honored the seniors of Creekside High School. My name is Makia Troy. I'm the athletic director at Creekside High School. There are 28 spring sport seniors. Many of them are multi-sport athletes. So this group of seniors, they, uh, the vast majority of them are four-year letter winners. We've seen great things from them. So many scholar athletes, including our valedictorian, tennis letter winner, Deshaun Johnson. The senior class of baseball players, they've experienced the state playoffs for three years. First time in school history, they look to make it a fourth to go out with a bang. I know they were looking forward to that. They've already made school history. I actually put a challenge out to, to them on Twitter to take this time to use some of the resilience and perseverance that the coaches have been teaching you. A lot of the same adversities they face in athletics that they've gotten over, you can learn to apply that in their life too. I'm just proud of everything that this senior class has accomplished. And that is it for sports. We'll take a break, wrap things up right after this. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact. Take a look at the uh, forecast for the next seven days. We have those showers and storms overnight and early in the morning. Then we clear out. It's going to be windy, cool Friday, chilly Saturday morning. And then by Sunday, another round of showers and storms will move our way before that ends on Monday and then drying out again Tuesday and Wednesday. Stay with us. I'll keep tracking these storms for you live on Up Late on 11 Alive.
today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. From 11 Alive News, Up Late starts now. Our new way of life will stretch on a little longer. We know Georgia's coronavirus is impacting your family in countless ways. There is a fire hose of information developing by the minute. We get it. So let's get you caught up on the big news.